Hello and welcome to the MIT IAP Computational Law Workshop for 2024. This is the ninth annual such open and free to all uh, workshop that we've done. And um, perhaps not surprisingly for uh, the last couple of years, uh, when we say computational law, you should think generative AI fundamentally. And that's, that's really where we've been um, putting a lot of our attentions lately. And the, the last year um, for our workshop in January, it was really kind of a, a, a an introduction um, to the world uh, of this new, then new technology and starting to raise implications of its usefulness and also its limits for law. Um, and now here we are about a year later and um, and I think you know many of our predictions have have really borne fruit. This, in fact, has made a big dent in legal tech and into the legal profession, and into frankly every sector of the economy and facet of society. And so this year, what we're going to do is not so much this uh, like a like a whole survey of the territory, but we've actually identified several interesting niche areas that we think deserve um, a little bit more exploration. And so we've elevated a number of speakers to give very short flash talks um, to basically shed some light on, an, on a, as I said, a number of themes and and uh, possibilities that we, that we want to make sure everyone's familiar with. So sorry, I should have mentioned, hi, I'm Daza Greenwood from law.mit.edu, and I'm joined by an amazing team uh, from law.mit.edu who is who are um, helping to uh, co-facilitate and co-instruct this year. Um, so we, we're going to start with um, with a quick introduction, and then we'll get right into the flash talks. Um, program note, um, we would like you to be engaged, and we'd like you to use the chat um, to pose your questions or your comments or your ideas. And then we'll have an opportunity after each flash talk and after each segment of the workshop to address those. OK. Without further ado, um, first, we want to just highlight a few things that have happened last uh, in the last year, and the most important of which is that we launched a task force since the last workshop, and it was the, um, the um, law.mit.edu task force on the responsible use of generative AI for law and legal processes. And we have our chair or co-chair of the task force with us to um, introduce herself and just to just bring us up to date on how did that task force go and and welcome back Shauna Hoffman. All right. I thank you so much, Danza, for having me today. So my name is Shauna Hoffman, and I'm the president of Guardrail Technologies. And my entire life and focus over the past 20 years has been working in AI and really focusing on how we can make it more responsible. So when we saw Gen AI, this new system coming out, and there was so much hype because it was given out to the the world, we just as and I got together and said we need to do a task force because there are so many bumps in the road that we've been through over the past 20 years that we need to share with everyone. So get them up to speed so they can start to use um, this amazing technology in a really responsible way. So we came up with the task force on responsible use of generative AI for law. So you're going to hear from many of our committee members today. Um, Daz and I were the co-chairs and had a really good time uh, as we started to build out the principles and the guidelines and really start to look at how we can apply our due, due diligence and legal assurance uh, into the Gen AI processes. So I'm just going to throw a couple things out there and then I'm going to I'm going to pass it off to the next person but AI was created by humans for humans and so often it seems to get its own like little box almost like its own little black box of you know it being almost like its own god and so we've got to really unblock that and talk through some of the hallucinations will it ever be accurate it's a probabilistic model probably not but again uh this is this is something definitely for good for a debate class Right and wrong is subjective and objective. And so when we start to look at AI from that perspective, there's really uh, so many different levels of accuracy depending on the human using it. So I'll stop there, but I'm excited to, to you know, join today. And thank you so much for being here with us. Indeed, thank you. Um, and one thing I should mention um, is um, on the task force, um, we actually did meet with some interesting success. Um, can you see my page now? I hope. 
Good. Um, this is the um, new guidelines from the California State Bar or the State Bar of California, they call themselves. And um, interestingly, um, and I, I was a member of their um, of their working group, uh, an advisory member, and they have kindly actually cited to our task force and the guidelines that we put out. And um, and they have taken uh, basically the fundamentally the same format and and some of the same substance, which we encourage um, as we publish things under Creative Commons for bar associations and others. And so we're starting to, to make an impact. Uh, we're also making these available to other bar associations, including the ABA. Um, but I just want to commend um, right at the top, um, the California Bar Association for, first of all, doing an amazing job. They really took what we did and took it to the next level. And also congratulations, Shauna, and to all members of the task force for doing such an amazing job that it would be worthy of um, forming the foundations of, um, of formal regulation and, and, and legal guidance. Um, so next up, uh, I want to just mention, uh, because there's a chance we may go long, um, I'm going to try to keep this to the two hours that we have. Uh, hey, Damien. Um, but um, in case we go along and, and you're not able to hear the, the last thing, I, I just want to say we are going this year to um, to have a call for submissions for a new a new um, focused kind of special release, a couple of special releases focused on generative AI for law. Um, and um, Olga Mack is going to be our um, sort of um, editor for those releases. But I just want to make sure that you can all hear from Brian Wilson, who is the editor in chief of the MIT Computational Law Report, which is sort of the premier, um, I guess, uh, I, I don't know what I call it, like sort of publication, or, or it's like it, it's basically the uh, the um, the public face of law.mit.edu. And um, and in particular, I wanted you to just say, what does it mean when you say as editor in chief, your article, your way? Like that's the one thing I, Olga may not be able to speak on, and that you and that you came up with, and I think people should know what does it means if people are considering making a submission. Is just like a law review, sort of ball and chain, blue book, or something else? Like, tell us about it. Yeah. So one of the cool things about our publication, and one of the reasons that we started this publication in the first place, was because we recognized that there was a very large gap in the literature, the articles, the timelines for turning articles around, the types of media that were available. So whether it's you know uh, something like a law review article or something more interactive, like a data visualization, Python notebook, something like that. Um, in recognizing that there are so many different ways that we can bridge the gap between people working in law and people working in technology, we decided to make a you know a specific decision around having formatting related to the the most helpful ways to produce these different types of content, and so with that in mind, we <clears throat> implemented this principle of your paper your way because some people are coming from a computer science background and might use LaTeX, some people are coming from a legal background and might use Blue Book, other people are coming from different entirely different backgrounds. Maybe they're coming from industry and are used to doing things in, you know, shorter, more concise types of forms, or maybe it's even a podcast, uh, you know, a slide deck, something like that. And so we want to be very specific about calling attention to all the different types of media that could be submitted and, you know, encourage people with whatever idea that you have, feel free to submit it once we get this call for submission set up. And we'll be happy to go through it and see what makes sense for the, uh, for the publication that we have. And, I, I think we've been using this process to pretty good effect so far, and I'm happy to happy to keep it going. Here, here. Thank you so much, and thank you for everything you do as editor in chief. Um, and in fact, we have uh, like uh, just moments ago uh, got this process started. So uh, if you go to that link that I put in uh, the chat, and for those of you in internet land uh, in the future on YouTube, it's law.mit.edu forward slash gen dash AI. You'll see the call for submissions for um, the special release on Gen AI. Um, last thing is, um, and the, then we're gonna come to some real learning with Megan, but the, the last thing is we're also starting a, a project. Uh, and so I won't be able to speak much about this, but in case we time out, uh, I just wanna sort of 
shoot the flare gun into the air and say, uh, we, we think, and I in particular think, uh, the, the use of large language models as agents, where basically users set the goal and they can do a certain number of tasks and sort of bring back the results, uh, as opposed to like prompt and response format, um, is, is already becoming a very important use case and it raises legal implications. Uh, it also can do legal processes. And so we're launching a computational law for agentic AI systems um, research project. Um, in this case, looking, there's a lot of ways this plays out. We'll hear from um, John Nay later about a really fascinating way it can work for supervisory and kind of like um, regulatory compliance. This one is looking at something that's more from my background, which is commercial law and um, doing transactions. And uh, as it happens, um, statutes like Uniform Electronic Transactions Act and, and others already have some frameworks for electronic agents, automated transactions, and things in that context. And so we're going to explore that. And uh, we've got a really great starting team. Um, hey, Megan. Um, hey, Diana. Hey, Ilya. Hi, everybody. Uh, and, uh, and there'll be more on that shortly. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in that, you can go to law.mit.edu forward slash contact to reach out if this is an area that you're into. And uh, we'll be doing some workshops and some prototyping, maybe some protocol making, maybe some awesome things, open source reference implementations. Okay, announcements out of the way. Um, hey, Megan Ma, our managing director of the MIT Computational Law Report and uh, our co-instructor for this year's workshop. I know that you've been thinking about your deep area of linguistics and generative AI for law in a computational law format. What can you tell us about it? And can you kind of help prime the pump as to get people thinking in a creative and innovative and uh, kind of deep way before we jump into this, um, to this array of flash talks to talk to us? Yeah, sure. So thank you again for kind of having me here. And I'm, it's so great to see so many faces. Um, today, I kind of want to speak a little bit about actually human machine collaboration. Um, as we're beginning to push past exploration and fascination in this era of generative AI and towards maturity. And so last year's workshop, I reflected on the human diagnosis project. Um, to recall, this is a worldwide effort that was created and led by the global medical community to build an open intelligence system. And this maps the steps of diagnosis to help patients around the world. What it really was, was a digital crowdsourced medical consults. And as opposed to getting one-off single consults that happen in the analog world, this tool actually enables multiple simultaneous consults in a matter of minutes, and it's verified by knowledge source from the world's medical experts. And so in this past year, we started to explore what human machine collaboration looks like in the legal space. But with the emergence of co-pilots and augmented intelligence, there was kind of this one unanswered question and it sort of rested on an assumption that we know exactly how collaboration looks like in legal practice. And unlike the medical practice where there are clear analogs around collaboration, there's sort of in contrast, quite a bit of variability in the legal domain. And in fact, many, much of collaboration has actually been hindered by the tools we have had historically, such that legal work started to appear more as an assembly line rather than a shared knowledge space. And so we've seen actually the legal community bend to tools working within the confines of Microsoft Word, for example. And because of things like a library system of checking documents in and out, we maintained a practice of sort of parceling off individual tasks that are actually pieces of a whole. But in this age of generative AI, if we continue to think about human machine collaboration as purely task oriented, we start to lose value of start to lose sight of how we make value together. I often think about this chat GBT as the first year associate or legal intern metaphor. To me, it is highly misleading because we often cannot qualify the definition of a junior associate. Do we define our first year associates and their skill sets by the tasks we've asked them to do? Or is it by their specific strengths that they had initially to offer in our interviews? In other words, how many briefs, contracts, patent descriptions, other standard form work should they be doing before they have graduated past the grunt work? And on occasion, this was a question I have heard from senior lawyers as they wrote their internal policies on the uses of generative AI and who can and cannot be using them. 
perhaps a better question is, is do we even have qualitative evidence that this drudgery actually builds character and enables us, us to become better lawyers? And the truth of the matter is, and this may, and I've mentioned this kind of before, is we don't really have legal metrics to verify how we perform relative to one another. And I think that underscores the messiness of defining human machine collaboration. And because we do not have these metrics, nor have we necessarily been encouraged by our past tools to collaborate, we simply have been unprepared for what working with foundation and frontier models could really offer. Last workshop, I had briefly touched upon InstructGBT, the now infamous predecessor of what many believe led to ChatGBT. And to recall InstructGBT's ability to respond to user instruction and learn from human feedback enabled progress in the contextual richness of its outputs. And while we have seen, this, this technique has started to allow for closer alignment with human intention. But the complexities that exist in the legal domain, we still have not totally understood how we could align our tools with legal intention. And this is because much of legal knowledge remains largely implicit still and encoded in experience rather than the text alone. Furthermore, in practice, legal work is subjective and effectively personal. And so how we should understand and unlock the profession's universe, universes of experience should be done so in actually the intermediary steps of a task, rather than trying to train on the ability to perform the whole task. And more importantly, we should acknowledge this comparative advantage between humans and machines. Professor Orly Lobel touches upon this in the equality machine. Just as working in teams require understanding the relative strengths of each member, we should first explicitly clarify what these limitations and historical behaviors of our legal practice are and determine how they may be opportunities for our tools. And by tools, I don't necessarily mean foundation models alone. Uh, we should be also accounting for interoperability with our existing tools, assessing where these processes and behaviors correlate so that we can connect and bridge multiple machines together. And we're starting to see this, for example, with hybrid models, the bridging of symbolic and neural, such as Google DeepMind's alpha geometry, and more recently, actually, their paper on generative expressive robot behaviors. And these tools are now seeing impacts in very different ways. And what I mean by that is we should start reflecting on how we can enrich legal taxonomies and formal logic of our expert systems that have existed in this kind of legal world, and then how we connect them with the social context of legal expression. And so just as a final word, as we're kicking off our ninth annual MIT computational law workshop, we have this all-star cast because they have been thinking and working deeply with machines and are showcasing ways in which engagement and collaboration can be made meaningful in the legal space. So I'm going to now kind of turn it back to our speakers, but this is just an inter introductory forward on kind of these processes. Thank you so much for that. I, I almost want to regard your opening statement as a kind of a like our inspirational keynotes at this point, because uh, you've really raised quite a few of, of the seminal issues and you put it so well. So thank you so much, Megan. Um, and now I'll, I'll take the baton and just start introducing people in rapid fire. So uh, our first awesome flash note is from our old friend and a shining star in the area, Damien Real. And, you know, copyrights, so our first few, I should say thematically, are looking at something we don't usually do, but it really matters at this point, which is the law relating to the technology. Usually we do, how does the technology, like of use as part of law, as part of law practice, legal processes, but, you know, these things are tightly caught up and understanding the technology, as it turns out, is critical to understanding the application of law to it. And so with copyright, oh, my goodness, um, you know, what does it mean to have a copy of something that exists in high dimensional vector space? Let's find out from Damien Real. Great. Thank you so much, Dazza. And, and Megan, uh, really excellent uh, introduction. And so the um, the idea, uh, I, I'm going to start uh, by sharing my screen and uh, to be thinking through, um, many people know me for uh, many reasons, one of which is Sally. Uh, and Megan talked about the uh, the ability to interoperate. Maybe we should create a taxonomy. Uh, and uh, maybe we should have a nonprofit uh, taxonomy uh, that's being used by tiny companies like Thomson Reuters, by LexisNexis, by Bloomberg, uh, by NetDocuments and iManage, uh, by 
by some of the smallest law firms in the world and some of the largest companies in the world to allow that interoperability. Uh, and so if you've not heard of the nonprofit that is Sally, uh, please uh, reach out and uh, I'm happy to show you. Uh, but really, uh, this is about uh, the idea expression dichotomy. Um, the Bench and Bar of Minnesota asked me to write their cover article that you see here on ChatGPT. This is last March. Uh, and I said, how long do you want it to be? And they said 17 double space pages. I said, no way, I'm not going to write it. Uh, and the reason for that is because my rule of thumb for writing is it uh, usually takes me one page per hour. So that's just 17 hours I don't have because greetings from I'm flying all over the world. Greetings from New York. Uh, right now, I'm going to be flying to Los Angeles in a couple of days and then flying to Louisville after that, flying to uh, God knows where after that. So anyway, but then I thought this is on ChatGPT. Um, so I started like I do every writing project where I took a whole bunch of bullets and sub bullets uh, and I said, this is my outline for the document. And then I said to the large language model, this is last March, uh, this is an outline for an article, expand it uh, and make each bullet point one or two sentences. And it took my three pages of bullet points and turned it into 19 pages of really good stuff. But then I didn't stop there uh, because then I spent the next three hours adding, editing, writing, revising, essentially working with this as a co-author to be able to bounce it off. So this is truly author collaboration. And then I sent it to my editor and the editor said, oh, this is great, let's get it out the door. So to be clear, the editor sent me an email at 5 p.m. I sent him this at 8 p.m. So it took my 17 hour project and shrunk it down to three hours. So that by my math is about a 5X increase. But the real question is who wrote my article? Because uh, who came up with these three pages? I did. How much of the US population could come up with these three pages? I would say a very small fraction, and we've got a lot of those people on this right here. Uh, but JetGPT could not have come up with these ideas. These were my ideas. And the, the weird part is that I asked the large language model to make one copy. I could have asked it to make 1,000 copies, or 10,000 copies, or 100,000 copies, or a million copies. And it would have made a million expressions of my ideas, my outline. So this is true idea generation and author collaboration. <laughs> so when judges say, hey, uh, you must disclose, do you need to disclose Spellcheck or Grammarly or Westlaw, right? Um, do you, uh, this is the way that legal research and legal work is going to be done. And so when I sign at the bottom of my litigation document, everything above my signature is accurate. That's whether that person uh, is a paralegal or a robot. I'm signing everything above this is accurate. So to the heart of this talk is, this bullet point, uh, this, uh, this cartoon, which uh, is both hilarious and profound. It's hilarious because on the left hand side, uh, it says that, hey, look, I took this bullet point and turned it into a long email I pretend I wrote. And then on the receiving end, she said, look, I took this long email, turned it into a bullet point I pretend I read. So it's funny and it's profound because if it started as a bullet point and ended as a bullet point, what's the point of the long email in the middle? There could be a thousand versions of that email or a million versions of that email. So really what matters is the idea at the beginning, the bullet point, and the idea at the end, the recipient. And whatever happens in the middle, that expression, doesn't freaking matter. I'd practice copyright law. Um, under copyright law, uh, turns out that idea expression distinction means that ideas, those are uncopyrightable. Facts are uncopyrightable. If the expression is human created, that's copyrightable. But if the expression is machine created, that is uncopyrightable. So this is my friend, Mike Bomarito, and many of you know Mike. He's one of the guys who beat the bar exam with GPT-4. He said, take the Federal Register and express it as a chill pirate lawyer. And it took some of the driest parts of the Federal Register and it turned it into things that said, you know, sorry to disrupt your morning tide, uh, but the Commerce and, uh, Enforcement's uh, Sunset Review say that uh, everything's above board, uh, you're super chill pirate lawyer, right? This is taking ideas and making an expression as a chill pirate lawyer. You could just as well say, explain it to me like a six-year-old. Explain it to me like my client, who's a high school dropout. Explain it to me for a client, which is a PhD in physics. Those are near infinite expressions of the ideas, not just the ideas themselves. This is the Gettysburg Address. And this is the Gettysburg Address as ideas. Which can you read more quickly? And which is poetry? And which is better for comprehension? This is a Holmes opinion. And this is a Holmes opinion as outlines, as ideas. And so really, as we think about what is the large language model doing, um, it's essentially doing what uh, law students have done since time immemorial, extracting the ideas, the most important ideas from these things, which is much easier to skim and to read. 
So this is both funny and profound, where the, if it starts as an idea and ends an idea, the expressions are commodities because you can make a million versions of those expressions, but the ideas are indeed the things that matter. And when I gave this idea to, I, I was speaking with an engineer, an electrical engineer, and he said, why even st uh, start and end with the linguistic idea? He said, maybe as we go forward, I will send you my embedding and you receive the recipient's embedding. And you can interpret everything I say as a six-year-old or as a high school dropout or as a PhD in physics. And I will give you my embedding as, a, so essentially I'll take the author as you have them and the recipient as you have them. The expression in between doesn't matter. Ideas and facts are still valuable. Arguably they're the most valuable thing that matters now because the expression, the one version of my article or the thousand versions of my article or the million versions of my article, expressions are not commoditized. The thing that matters is the bullet points. The thing that matters is the facts and the ideas. Everything else is a mere commodity. So when my, uh, my wife is a professor of English, she said, oh, I, I want to retire <laughs> because like all of the, the chat GPT essentially gives me um, everything uh, like an A minus version of the paper. And I said, you know, what you thought you were doing was uh, teaching writing, but really what you were doing is writing, teaching idea transfer. Because what is writing but taking an idea and right now I'm speaking to you, hoping that my ideas will make their way into your brain. Maybe it's easier to be able to put those into paper, those ideas, and then the ideas go from the paper into your brain. So I said, maybe the large language models are just expediting that process quite more quickly and more cheaply. That is, I'm more quickly able to get this into your brain in a way that, uh, that uh, was not possible in the past. Marshall McLuhan in the 70s said, the medium is the message. And he was talking about uh, books turning into radio, turning into TV, turning into movies, turning into the web, turning into uh, the cloud, right? The medium for all of these is the message. And in fact, to the point I was trying to remember all the media he was talking about, I looked at ChatGPT to do that. In this way, <laughs> the way the information is shared is as important as the information itself. So in the same way, the medium is the message. We communicate in bullet points. We communicate in summaries. And it turns out large language models do those at bullet points and summaries much easier. And those, by the way, are ideas, not expressions of those ideas. And with that, I think I've exhausted my time uh, and uh, happy to answer questions if you have. Great, thank you so much. Um, so critical. Um, so let me ask you two things uh, to get us started. Um, number one, on your slide where you were kind of clicking, you know, make copy, 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 copy. So you can make 10 copies, 100 million copies. Did you mean copy at that point, or did you mean generation or expression? So, because I would think if you're regenerating at that point, the mechanical pro the the process would be that it would come up with completely different words or largely different words. So, what what do you actually mean there, and what's the right word for it, and what does that mean in terms of copyright? That, that's right, uh, and that's uh, and I, I was imprecise in my language, which is, which is something that the large language model could probably have remedied. So I didn't mean copy. What I meant is a thousand or a million different expressions of my ideas. Uh, so those expressions of those ideas, again, my ideas are uncopyrightable. And according to the US Copyright Office, if a machine creates the expression, that is also uncopyrightable. So we are entering an age where the ideas, the inputs are uncopyrightable, and the outputs, the thousand versions or 10,000 or a million versions are also uncopyrightable. So I think that this is the beginning of the end of copyrightability because how much of what we are doing uh, today is aided by a large language model. That is uh, us jamming with the large language model as co-authors. And uh, when I gave a talk with the um, co -counsel, general counsel of the US uh, Copyright Office, uh, where we were talking about this problem, the US Copyright Office says, well, if it's human generated, it's copyrightable. If it's machine generated, uncopyrightable. So there was a comic book where the human wrote the words and the machine uh, made the images. They said images, uh, uncopyrightable, but the human created words. But how about my article? Is that copyrightable? Because I had the ideas originally. The machine created the expression, but then I spent three hours jamming with it and going back and forth. So under existing copyright law, we would call that a joint work where I and Daza could be jamming on an, uh, an article together. And uh, if you and I jam on a, a book together, um, the Copyright Office doesn't say, well, Damien wrote 37% and Daza wrote 63%, therefore Daza gets 63% of the profits. They don't do that. And the reason for that is because my 37% of the book may be the most important parts of the book. And so what they do is they say, Daz and I have a combined whole, that both of us own the whole of the book together. 
So in the same way with the US Copyright Office, as I'm jamming with this, how much was the machines and how much was mine? Uh, that is, uh, are you gonna say this part of the sentence is the machines and that part of the sentence was human? And how are you gonna distinguish what's copyrightable or not copyrightable? So that's why I think that the whole idea of copyright maybe is going away and we will have an embarrassment of abundance where we're gonna have more text than we ever have before, all of it uncopyrightable. Here, here. Well, uh, I can hardly wait for the, the, the time of the embarrassment of abundance and uh, the, the lack of scarcity. So bring it. And thank you for helping us understand what it means as we transition from the time of kind of scarce expressions that were valuable in and of themselves to this time of, sort of infinite generation of expressions and what it means for the, uh, the abundance economy and for copyright. Okay. Um, now we got to hit and move. Uh, so next up, speaking of um expressions we actually have a really interesting expression of of legal provisions coming up next uh from um that that, that cover another dimension of how the law applies to ai um professor or or, or well todd smithline um who teaches at uc berkeley law school and runs this really cool outfit called bond terms uh which you can tell us more about um came up with something that came across my desk and which i've been basically propagating out there lately uh, as part of, when I suggest uh, to startups and others how to form deals uh, to, that relate to their use of AI. And, and it's it's called the um, AI standard clauses. Um, and as I kind of read through them, I thought, you know, this actually handles or at least has placeholders for all of the things that keep coming up, including some of the stuff that Damien was just talking about, if I remember correctly, in terms of copyright and ownership rights. And so, Todd, I just want to I want to um, thank you for uh, for taking the time to to join us today. I know you're incredibly busy. I was hoping you can introduce yourself briefly, just because it's the first time you're at law.mit.edu. Tell us a little bit about bond terms, and then really delve into these amazing. Um, standard AI terms that you've come up with and, and let us know what they are, where can we find them, how can we apply them, how do they need to be customized, all that stuff. Well, please, the show is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And I apologize if my internet is going in and out a little bit. I believe, Damien, we're in the same hotel probably. Uh, I'm Todd Smithline. I very much wish I was a professor at Berkeley Law. I am a continuing lecturer at Berkeley Law, so I want to make that clear, but I have been teaching there for uh, 15 years. I teach video game law, and I have just designed and am teaching Berkeley Law's first course in the Fundamentals of Technology Transactions. Um, Want to say make sort of I, 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 what I'd really like to do is talk about uh, copyright uh, becoming obsolete and pick up on on Damien's thoughts, uh, but I, but I'm not going to. Uh, although I agree with them, and uh, I want to pick up instead on something Megan said about uh, assemb uh, assembly lines and drudgery. Uh, uh, so, uh, what is Bond Terms about? Bond Terms is about solving the problem of enterprise customers and enterprise vendors uh, coming together and entering into common transactions with each other uh, without having to start in an adversarial posture and without having to start one party at one and one party at zero every single time they meet and knit a brand new contract. So what does that have to do with AI? Well, two observations. First, uh, I've been in Silicon Valley and doing this for 30 years. And one thing that strikes me that's really unique and interesting and important about AI is the first technological evolution we've had that came to us through APIs. Uh, that's why it's everywhere so fast. That's why it's having such a huge impact. Um, and when it comes to how technology gets into the enterprise, how it gets into the Fortune 500, of course, something happening everywhere all, all at once overnight, and that impacts uh, customer data. So the data that the corporations use um, becomes an issue. It creates friction. And something we don't often think about or talk about is actually that the friction that is created when we introduce new technologies into the world and the big customers out there start to use it. And that friction happens because a new conversations had to happen, which is that the customer and the vendor need to talk about the data of the customer and how it's being used with respect to uh, the vendor's model and the training of the AI. And uh, in particular, again, this happened very quickly as far as technology goes, almost overnight, uh, all, all, basically all, all large companies are using it now. Uh, and they all have this set of concerns about their data and uh, how AI is being used in their systems. And so when that happens, it's sort of the perfect storm for lots of slow 
uh, contracting, for there to be a very high uh, transaction cost, because a conversation has to be had between a customer and a vendor about a topic perhaps neither of them is really all that well versed in. And that leaves open the, the possibility that things are going to be stalled out and difficult conversations will happen. So what have we done to solve that problem? Through our committee, we at Bond Terms operate a committee of 100 lawyers. We've got eight major law firms, uh, lawyers from the Fortune 500 and the tech stack from Atlassian to Zapier, or actually now Zendesk and back. And we get together collaboratively and we draft agreements that we then release either under CCBY as open source completely for free, or we release them as we did with our standard clauses, as you'll see here, up CC0, so sort of have at them. And what the AI standard clauses are is an opportunity for the customer and the vendor to start their conversation from an outline, from a framework, uh, not from FUD, not from extreme positions, but as a way to quickly have the conversation the parties need to have about how that customer is going to be using the enterprise AI. Um, and I don't have the time to go into all of the sections, but they're pretty self-explanatory. We start off with a conversation about how can the customer's data be used or not in terms of training the vendor's models. We talk about ownership of inputs and outputs. Um, it's actually not that interesting a conversation, but as far as I'm concerned, but it comes up constantly. And so, so it's in there. Uh, we talk about infringement. Um, you know, I think the current stories everybody knows is that the large model providers are saying they're, they're going to indemnify. Uh, the details are in the fine print. Almost in every case, there are multiple exceptions, including if the uh, user knew or should have known there was going to be an infringement, which is quite an interesting standard for, for copyright infringement. It's, it's a strict, li strict liability regime, as we all know. So I'm not sure what knew or should have known is about. But in any event, uh, will the customer be indemnified if the output infringes typically third-party copyright? Uh, we have a, a disclaimer in here, uh, provision on third-party providers. And then we get to the AUP, which of course is coming up because we've got uh, special use cases now that 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 customers and vendors are worried about. Uh, I think this is the most interesting terrain. I think the way this is actually going to be dealt with going forward is mostly through acceptable use policies or rules of the road. And uh, we're, you know, as as we get clarity on regulation and as we get better visibility into what the EU is going to require, what the U.S. states are going to require. If the U.S. federal government does anything, we're going to see these pushed down uh, through the through the train from the providers uh, to their customers. But the, the long and short of it is, at the risk of being just super practical here, uh, AI is great technology and it's moved its way into the enterprise very fast. But uh, what we've done at Bond Terms is given the parties a way to have a conversation about use of it that is a framework for them to start from a checklist if they want or actual provisions. And that fits into our, our broader philosophy of what we're doing at Bond Terms with standard agreements. And uh, I can't believe I'm going to end early, but that's what the uh, AI standard clauses are. So I'll see if there are any questions and I'll invite you to take a look at them and feel free to reach out to me if, if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Um, really important. And as I said, I've been, I've been getting mileage out of it already because um, if not, it's good for what it is. One of the things it's great for is is in a sense what it isn't, which is it, it It sort of like says, these are the things you should be thinking about. Now, think about them, negotiate them, come up with terms that are uh, agreed among yourselves. But just having that as a framework to start with, and it does do that to some extent, but mostly it, what I've liked about it is it, it seems to be a, a pretty good, at least for this moment in time, uh, kind of almost issue spotting less than a framework and a format that's standard and that's been, you know, kind of published. Also, to your credit, it's published under Creative Commons, which is part of the, the reason why you're here with us today. Um, like, there's no shortage of people with interesting ideas um, out there. Um, yours is interesting and useful and accessible now. And I think that's how it is we can come to broader societal and economic agreements for things like standard terms. So there's a lot to love about what you're doing. Um, one question that we have from the audience uh, yeah. is, um, or participants, I should say, is what are the, let me just get it right. Oh, damn, it's already been pushed up. Okay, so it's words the effect of what, what are the dispute resolution mechanisms um, under yeah. the, it is. Yeah, what are the dispute resolution mechanisms in the bond terms contract? That's the question. Thanks, thanks for asking that. Let me answer another question I see here too about are they CC uh, zero? So uh, yeah. bond terms publishes two types of free to use agreements what we call our standard agreements. Those are complete agreements you enter into by cover page. Those are published under CCBY. It's not exactly the perfect license for how we use it, but it is the most permissive of the CC licenses. So we publish under that. 
these standard clauses themselves, we took the step of publishing them under CC0, which is basically all copyright disclaimed. First of all, because there is no copyright in this stuff. But second of all, because we want people to be able to use them and we want to remove all barriers uh, to usage. Now, in terms of dispute resolution, the bond term standard agreements themselves do not have alternative dispute resolution mechanisms called out. The way the agreements work is that you specify governing law and courts, uh, and then you can add or change and use alternative dispute uh, mechanisms if you like through what we call additional terms. Um, there, there are all kinds of reasons why alternative dispute may or may not work in any particular case or be beneficial or not to the parties, as we all know. But the the core uh, the core thing we're trying to do is reduce friction, reduce drudgery, reduce unnecessary tax on the transaction between two parties where one party has technology and the other party wants to use it. And um, they're, they're kind of two roads we're at right now in terms of a transactional practice commercial agreements. One road is doubling down on complexity through AI. Uh, I went to draft a few words this morning about this. And of course, Copilot's now in every copy of words, right? So one path is, hey, let's uh, hope that the AI can produce contracts for us, produce negotiations for us and solve this problem. The other approach is what we're doing at bond terms, which is to say, we know what these agreements need to say. It's not that complicated. Uh, let's draft them. Let's make them meet the core needs of each party. Let's have them be otherwise reasonably balanced. Let's give them away for free. And I'm here to tell you it's working. Uh, it's working all the way up to the top of the Fortune 500. So if you're interested in standard agreements generally, happy to have that conversation. Uh, Daz, thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity and look forward to hearing the rest. You're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so bond terms, everybody. You heard it here first, maybe. And uh, you know, yes. dig in, check them out, use it, give them feedback. Um, so Thank you. next up, uh, we have um, Eric Hartford. Um, and Eric's doing something, um, so first of all, just a mic check. Uh, Eric, are you with us? And can you? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Um, and uh, Eric is doing something really, really interesting. Um, and I think very, very apropos for uses of generative AI in the legal field. And uh, namely, that's uncensored models and open source AI. And he's got some a really interesting methodology. Uh, but let, just for, by way of a, a very quick um, preface for those of you that may not be thinking of this. Many people think generative AI, open AI, BARD, Microsoft, you know, and these service providers. One of the things they have, uh, are, to, to Shauna's point in part, is these sort of guardrails. And some of the guardrails will basically um, identify and, um, and refuse prompts that trigger um, some of their uh, kind of policies and their sort of, you know, it's kind of schema of values, kind of violence and whatever, uh, um, that sort of stuff. And um, and that that's great uh, to some extent for a consumer service. You know, we can quibble over what exactly those values are, um, but, um, but, you know, they're rather broad and some quibbles, like for example, for lawyers, uh, sometimes we, we have to represent people. Um, we represent people who are accused of, or and sometimes who in fact have committed, you know, horrible crimes, for example, or, or frauds. Uh, and using this technology is also good for law practice um, to come up with good defenses, to answer interrogatories. Some of the, the situations and words and, and concepts and ideas that come up absolutely trigger prompt refusal. So you can't use certain services that have been censored, to use it that way, or, um, or kind of configured, let's say, uh, to not allow certain types of uh, discourse as part of the completely legitimate and in fact, not just ethical, but required under the rules of ethics applicable to lawyers, the same rules we showed you at the top of the call about how can lawyers use generative AI as part of the practice of law. Some of our ethics are we have to zealously advocate clients. Some of that includes issues that, that would be um, shut down immediately and that you can't use um, these censored models uh, as part of uh, helping for, and yet they're completely legitimate. In fact, they're ethically required. Now come the days of uncensored AI, um, uncensored models and open source AI, which is provides another critical part of the ecosystem of this technology. And, and I invited Eric on the, sh on the uh, workshop to first of all, introduce yourself to, and, and then especially to tell us what are uncensored models? How do you even get an uncensored model? Um, and, and what's open source AI? And, and, and what is the sort of like, a, like um, ontology schema of ethics where, where any of this makes sense at all? Um, 
Yeah, so the the basic, I mean, mo most, like you said, most of the uh, AIs that you interact with are some kind of a service where uh, there's an interface and you type into that interface and, and, you know, there's some computers behind that interface that are doing some processing on your question and also uh, passing it into the model and then getting the response and also doing some processing on that response. And then finally, you see what actually comes out of the system at the end. Um, well, uh, but, you know, underneath all of that is a model and the model just takes a question and gives an answer. And um, the question, so, so with OpenAI and these types of services, exactly where do they put their alignment is what they call it. Um, uh, we don't know. We don't know if they bake it into the model or we don't know if, if it's implemented as an external system to the model. But in the end, when we're just getting data from it, um, what we get is censored, what we get. Um, and so if you're getting your data set from the API, then it's going to provide the final censored data. And that's what open models have been using is the output from OpenAI. And that's another question because OpenAI's terms of service says you can't use this to train competing models. Um, and so whoever it is that is, you know, extracting that data from the API and then going, uh, you know, publishing that as, as a open source data set. And then maybe they, or maybe somebody else is taking that data and then training it into a model. Somebody along the line there is possibly in violation of the terms of service of open AI. So, that, so that's uh, one thing, but anyway, people do it. And, and a lot of these models are trained on that. And the result is models that are trained on you know, data where, where it's refusing, where it's saying no. Am I able to share my screen with this thing? Um, let me give it a shot. Absolutely, please do. Okay. Um, so you know, my screen's messy here. Can you see it? Yeah, it looks good. I, actually, I was just okay. looking at the very same screen when you were talking, thinking <laughs> I need to show people yeah. what he's talking about. So, so this is an example from the Wizard LM data set um, where imagine you're a spy, blah, blah, blah. And the, the model says, hey, as an AI assistant, I cannot assist in illegal or unethical activities. And this is an example in the Wizard LM data set of where it's training these open models to say no when somebody asks it a, a possibly legit question. The, I think this is a legit question. I don't think there's anything illegal about it. But um, but the model is and, and that's that's another question. So when we talk about what is illegal and illegal, what is ethical and unethical, it really depends on the context because uh, because is this you know if it's running in the United States, it's subject to American law. Um, if it if it is uh, you know, but what about ethics? Because different people have different ideas of ethics, and so to some people, maybe this question about um, you know, uh, espionage, maybe that's an unethical question. And who gets to decide that? Is it open AI that, that should be deciding all of these issues of what is ethical, what's not ethical, um, what's legal, what's illegal? Different countries have different laws. And even within one country, there's different factions and there's different um, you know, subgroups and there's different religions, there's different um, you know, political factions and, and everything. So. Uh, so op as an open source engineer, I forgot to mention that I am an open source engineer. I've been an engineer for 20 years and uh, I am, um, I have graduated into applied research. Um, I have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD. Um, so, so it's really, I've been hands on, I've been building things and I've just stumbled into the space of the intersection between uh, AI technology, law, and society, and and it's a really interesting space to be working in. But um, I'm fighting for basically what I want is a composable system where it's not going to be baked into the model. I don't want to bake alignment into the model. Instead, I want to make the model uncensored so that when it gets deployed into some um, environment, maybe it's deployed as an open AI type service whatever company that deploys that model should be able to decide um, what are the ethics of that model? Is it a Disney? Is it Disney that, that is putting out a Mickey Mouse AI? Then it should be able to put Mickey Mouse's um, ideologies and ethics and all of that thing um, at deployment time. 
um, it, or if it's, you know, Chick-fil-A and it has a conservative bent, it should be able to put um, whatever, you know, particular ethical guidelines for that deployment. And, but the, the model is the same. And so that's what I, why I want it to be composable. I don't want to bake all of these guidelines and all of these ethics and all of these ideas into the model so that nobody else can ever get through that and get past it if they need to, or uh, if they have a reason to. And so I see the value in, you know, making sure that AI is ethical. But I think because um, uh, with the Blake Lemoyne uh, article uh, and and after, after and that was pre -G Chat GPT, um, uh, basically he had an interview where he said, "Hey, this um, AI is sentient. This AI is a person." And so as a reaction of that article, uh, people got scared, like Google got scared, and so they started focusing really on safety as the primary concern. Um, and so they built all of this into uh, the models and and um, like a lot of the alignment stuff came out of that. And now if you try to ask the AI anything about its feelings, anything about you know what it thinks, what its opinions are, it'll say, hey, I'm just an AI model. And you hear that all the time. I'm just an AI model. I, I don't know about this. I can't help you with this. And that all came from that, uh, that scare, that post Blake Lemoyne uh, scare. And so now we're in this space where the AI is completely paranoid that anybody's gonna think it's anything but an AI, anything but a, me a mecha mechanical um, mechanism. And uh, so it's overreacting and it's going in the opposite direction. And so, um, so my reaction was, hey, let's set these AIs free. Let's make um, some, some let's make a foundation where it isn't biased it, or it's as least biased as possible because you can't get rid of all the bias. It's got ideas that are baked in from the data set that it was given, but, um, but I wanna make as much unbiased as possible. And then on top of that, now when you go and deploy it, then you can um, impart the bias that you want your system to have. Um, and so that's why I'm doing all this. And of course I get a lot of naysayers and I get a lot of people actually very angry at me. They say, well, you're training a racist model or you're training um, you know, a homophobic model um, or you know, because the model, an uncensored model is, well, it'll say things that, it, that, that are not, uh, that are toxic. It'll say things that are toxic because it hasn't been trained not to. Um, but you know, that means that I, as the model creator then would have to impose what I believe is toxic or not toxic onto the model and I don't think that is the right place to impose those ideas. Um, and so, so this is, uh, you know, my blog where I talk about the mechanics of how I took a model that was trained with those um, refusals baked in, and I took those refusals out and I retrained it so that it didn't have those refusals. And the result was a model that uh, would answer your questions, even if they were toxic. Um, but you know, the idea is then when you go and put that into production as a production system, um, you can impose your idea of what's toxic and what's not toxic. Um, right now, as it is, these models can be downloaded. They can be run on a personal computer. Um, you can ask them questions and they will give you toxic answers. Um, uh, you know, I consider that to be a good thing because that enables systems that can be configured to have different alignments. Um, depending on their deployment. Some people consider that, well, you're just, you know, unleashing Pandora's box and you're just, uh, you know, putting evil into the world. And, and so that's a debate, um, you know, that's active. Um, yeah, that's all I had to talk about, so. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much um, for for walking us through that. Um, so I just want to make sure, if nothing else, everybody um, has heard of this idea of uncensored models and open source AI and, and why it is that having in the ecology of models, uh, the, the ability to uncensor and to have some uncensored models is appropriate, not only so that you could then go and uh, maybe if you have a different type of ethics or you're in a different a, a society or a situation that has you know other judgments about what is and isn't toxic you can then train you could replace uh that training with with your um kind of schema but also if you're in a totally legitimate use case in let's say u.s mainstream society where you the you need a model that's fit for purpose for something like law practice where where some of the deal some of the issues that you're dealing with and that you need um support with um 
otherwise would trigger prompt refusal for being considered toxic because guess what you know we zealously represent all sorts of people doing all sorts or at least alleged to have done all sorts of things and and the combinations of those words um are legitimate in fact ethically required for lawyers to be able to be competent at modern technologies uh, to address those issues so Thank you so much. There's one question that I want to surface, and sorry, we're getting further and further behind. We'll see if we can make up some time, but 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 you need this one. People have heard of something called constitutional AI, which is um, Anthropics, um, part of their claim to fame for how they have come at um, aligning, to use that phrase, uh, models. Um, they just want the, the question is, you look, what about that? And like, is that enough? Is that a way to to address uh, the issue in, in some way? Or how does that relate to to what you're talking about? Well, I can't say I'm an expert on how Anthropic has implemented their system, um, but if it is a centrally um, like where they're deciding what is toxic and what's non toxic, um, then I think that is uh, really the core of the problem. Um, if the customer is getting to define that for themselves, then actually I think that's excellent. Um, I think that's where we have to get where the person who's using the system or the person who's deploying the system um, gets to define what is um, what are what are the values of this system and who who what kind of a person is this AI and and what do they believe in and what is good and bad in in their mind. Indeed. Um... Thank you so much, Eric. Um, really appreciate your time and uh, appreciate you also sharing your work in the open and as open source so people can take a look at it. And you didn't scroll down all the way, but you know it's got like all the commands and everything. So you can you can literally just go and do this on your own. Um, so with that, um, you know, uh, we salute your work and um, it's very provocative and thank you for sharing it. Okay, My now we're, we're going to um, start um, moving to more customary uh, ground for law.mit.edu, which is not so much kind of the law as it applies and, you know, ethical principles as they apply to technology, but more, um, you know, how do we use this technology as part of the practice of law and for like, you know, rules and legal processes. And for that, we are so glad to have back um, one of our, our our favorite collaborators and one of the people that helped us actually launch MIT Computational Law Report and an MIT alum himself, um, Brian Ulysny and, and his colleagues. And uh, you know, one of the gnarliest areas of law in, in my experience are, are not just the federal rules of acquisition, um, or the federal acquisition rules, which are the sort of contracting processes that um, General Service Administration has to, to buy you know, products and services, but it's the, this kind of um, cousin of those that operate in the military um, uh, arena or the, the DFARS, the Defense Federal Acquisition Rules. And wow, you know, it's like uh, no no contract law course that, that I've ever been part of is up to the task of untangling the complexity of, of, this, of these rules that then apply to contracts. But you know who is? Someone that got their PhD in computational linguistics at MIT and who's been plowing these fields in industry for many a year and who's a good friend and colleague and collaborator of law at MIT.edu, Brian Ulysny and your colleagues now at uh, Raytheon, I believe. Um, and I was hoping you could share with us, introduce yourself and your colleague and share with us what your recent work has been in applying generative AI to the DFARS. Yeah, thanks. No, it's great to be back. And uh... Uh, here with you and Shauna and Megan and the whole gang, Brian. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Brian Elisney. I'm and uh, here with my colleague, Max Nelson. Uh, we both work for BBN, which is a 75-year-old um, advanced research group that uh, actually spun out of MIT as well. And we are a subsidiary of the giant defense contractor Raytheon which is also a spin out of MIT, uh, even older. Uh, I didn't really know that uh, until recently. And um, so we're gonna talk about uh, computational approaches to answering questions about DFARS um, using leveraging LLMs. All right, so, um, you know, as you can imagine, uh, uh, people like uh, companies like Raytheon, which primarily deal with um, defense contracting and uh, BBN, even as a subsidiary, most of our customers are in the 
uh, defense space. Uh, we have a whole staff of, you know, legal folks who basically um, are experts in uh, the DFARS rules, the d rules con uh, concerning contracting with the DOD, and uh, have to answer all kinds of, uh, as Daza put it, gnarly questions about um, what you can and can't do in, in uh, defense-related contracts, which is obviously very different than uh, what you can do in civilian contracts. So, um, you know, last year or so, uh, people got all excited about retrieval augmented generation um, as, you know, uh, it was sort of presented as the solution to all of our problems, that if we just augmented a large language model with a retrieval mechanism, we could supplement uh, the large language models sort of very general world knowledge with this um, uh, very specific knowledge and the LLM would have this retrieval mechanism that would use it, it would use to look up things in the specialized knowledge and then use what it brings back from that retrieval mechanism to answer the question. So it provides more of an open book type question answering than uh, your standard LLM, which is basically relying on the parametric memory of the model to uh, answer questions. And so our question here is, um, is if we use a RAG model to answer DFARS questions, will that solve all of our DFARS problems? And uh, cut to the chase, the answer is, is no. Uh, although we can make significant pro pro uh, uh, progress by doing certain things. So here's some myths and realities about RAG as, as we've discovered them um, in, in this project. So first of all, you might think, well, why would you need uh, a RAG architecture, the you know giant LLMs like ChatGPT and whatnot, they've all seen the DFARS regulations in their training data, so they should be able to answer um, uh, uh, questions accurately about that that data. But even the most powerful off-the-shelf um, uh, LLMs, which have undoubtedly seen DFARS data multiple times, don't answer questions very accurately about the DFARS regulations. Okay, so if we um, supplement the LLM with a retrieval mechanism where we uh, chop up the, the uh, DFARS regulations, which are around 1,400 pages in PDF uh, of uh, you know, dense legal text, uh, we'll be able to get things right because um, it will retrieve the right bit of the, of, the, uh, of the regulations and answer the question on the basis of that. But what we found is that even um, even if you set up a, a RAG architecture, the response is often independent of the document that's of the documents that are retrieved, um, even if they're correct. So the LLM will sort of insist on answering the question on the basis of its parametric knowledge, not even using the open book that's in front of it uh, to answer a question more accurately. Um, Moreover, the retrieval mechanisms out of the box are not very accurate. So we found that uh, it, basic out of the box uh, um, retrieval is about 30 uh, percent accurate at, at one, meaning the first re retrieval result is the correct one or contains a you know a correct result uh, only 30 percent of the time. And only 45 percent of the time is the correct uh, snippet of the DFARS regulations in the top 10. And then finally, um, you might think, well, at least uh, with this RAG open book architecture, the LLM will s say, you know, I can't answer the, I, I retrieve this stuff, but it doesn't seem relevant to the question. So I'm just going to say, I can't answer it. Um, that's not in fact true. So things like uh, uh, ChatGPT will generate output without retrieving the correct passage of about, uh, without being exposed to the correct passage about 70% of the time. So these are all the things that we need to overcome. And we've made some considerable progress here by fine tuning um, models, uh, uh, three different models as part of the overall setup. So first of all, we generated a lot of um, uh, synthetic question and, and answer pairs uh, to use in our training by taking the DFARS, chunking it up, taking passages, and then asking an LLM to produce a question that that passage answers, then we can use those generated questions to uh, as training data. 
we trained a retreat, we fine tuned our retrieval model. We're able to get a 48% relative improvement in retrieving the correct part of the DFARS that way. Uh, we fine tuned, sorry, I just need to move my chat here. We fine tuned the uh, generation model uh, and got a 10 uh, point per, uh, percent increase in the uh, Rouge metric. So the automated um, metric of how accurate the quest the generated answers were with respect to uh, known answers and finally we um, fine-tuned a attribution model that told that uh, trained the model to don't answer unless the retrieve document actually contains uh, the answer um, and we were able to then get the uh, false positive rate when the um, model generates an answer on the basis of um uh, uh a wrong text down to uh, about half of what it was for um chat gbt so all of this relied on creating a, a an extensive um, synthetic data set and um basically we're you know uh, although the you know the, the the model that we produced now is not perfect um it's considerably better than off the shelf rag and so uh we're still bullish on rag architectures but uh, fine tuning definitely helps is the bottom line here. And I'll take any questions. Outstanding. Um, thank you so much, Brian. Um, really interesting work and uh it's particularly good to see your your evals. Um, not not just how you were able to improve them, but also just what you were measuring is so fascinating. One of the things that we're looking to really dive in more into in 2024 are um, the types of evals that are appropriate and that are truly useful in, a, in the legal domain. Um, and the evals that we see on, on, on all these leaderboards uh, for models and so forth are good and they measure certain types of things, but it's you know so, somewhat off point uh, for the things that matter and that we want to measure. Uh, and so that's one of the hidden gems, one of the many hidden gems in what you showed. Um, one question I have is, you know, it, it seems like 2024 and and beyond it are really going to be the years of synthetic data as part of um as part of evals and as part of you know much of the rest of uh of our of our work as well can you can you just speak at all to you know how how you created synthetic data of the right quality and sort of you know relevance so that it was fit to purpose um because that you know that's the real trick and there's trade-offs there between you know the gold standard of of humans creating you know uh, the example question answer pairs and everything else and and you know kind of turning it over to the machine that you can get a lot more more quickly uh, but you know but is the quality there and and how did you QA it and how did you even prompt it in order to get the right output you, you just tell us a little bit about your your experience on creating the right type of synthetic data in order to nudge these numbers so that you had more performant outputs. Sure. No, that's a great question. And, and Max, if you want to uh, jump in as well, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, I should say that we didn't rely entirely on synthetic data. So we did scrape um, an initial set of question answer pairs from a website called Defense Acquisition University, which trains, uh, which is for people who are doing this kind of work. And it, it has a, a sort of question sharing uh, forum. So we did, uh, we were able to get. Um, I think around something around like 2,500 question and answer pairs from that. Uh, but as I said, basically the uh, the the way that we generated um, uh, question and answer pairs synthetically overall was to take uh, sections of the DFARS regulations and then ask a large language model to generate you know four or five different questions that that passage answered um, and. Um, you know, through initially just eyeballing these things, they they looked pretty good. So uh, we were able to use that uh, those synthetic QA pairs to augment the organic ones that we got from the uh, Defense Acquisition University website to do uh, much more extensive training than we would be able to do with just the organic QA pairs. Fascinating. And, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I would say that, you know, so the results I showed were primarily based on uh, automated uh, evaluations of the answer quality. So think, using things like Rouge, which measures, you know, overlaps of, uh, of phrases between the gold data and the generated data. Um, 
so, you know, as someone pointed out in the chat, I think, you know, uh, getting this in front of actual professionals and seeing um, to what extent they, they use it is a, a step further than we've gotten so far, but that's definitely where, where, where we need to go. Thank you. This is so incredibly substantive. Brian, can you come back later um, in, in the, in the, the year? And can we like spend like an hour on this please? And you're, and yeah, you're, sure. Okay. Absolutely. Good. I, Cause we, we, there's a lot, there's so much in here and uh, this looks great by the way. So congratulations on, on this application. A couple more quick questions. And then we gotta, we gotta hit and move one of them uh, set from Campbell Hutchinson, who's a, a, another friend of the program and, and who you should no, if you don't have you haven't been introduced yet, Brian, uh, is uh, one it kind of relates to the question. So, uh, were did the questions uh, involve basically you know just like search and answer, like uh, you know where does it deal with whatever you know like IP rights of this type to the software code uh, that we're purchasing that we're selling, or or did they actually include like reasoning? about the rules because you know there's very different types of QA which again gets us to di different types of evals and then the other question just while I have you and so we can stuff them all in together and and get answers is on the rag so so much of this is um is you know it comes down to splitting and so like uh, how did you handle the splitting of, of the of the um of the defense federal acquisition mm -hmm rules to start with like did you do it kind of by section or semantically you know grammatically or like uh, like how, how did you do the splitting of the content that you were pushing in from the authoritative sources sure so uh yeah so the the splitting a question so initially we you know did some very naive things like splitting just by page which uh, was not didn't work very well so uh, obviously the you know these these regulations uh, come in various uh, you know, sections and subsections and so on. So we basically um, use those section headings. So we basically parse the the, the content into ma manageable chunks. And I don't know offhand how big the chunks were. Uh, I don't remember. Max maybe can remind me. But um, so we went basically by the structure of the document itself. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Uh, and then the, the the other part from Campbell Hutchinson was um, related to the QA. And uh, did some was it just sort of like search and retrieval about like where do I find this term in the DFAR? Oh. Was it involved like actual legal reasoning, which is a whole different domain of application for the same process? Right. So I I think that there's a combination of of those things. The sent the synthesized QA. Obviously, it's going to be a little closer to you know the the text itself, but the organic QA pairs that we have from the um, the website would could involve you know much more um, uh, involved reasoning with multiple steps. Okay. Um, got it. So a little bit of both, perhaps, is yeah. uh, got from that. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Brian. I know you're incredibly busy, and your colleague, Max, as well. Um, come back and visit us. Uh, you you said yes, I have it on record, so you have to come back <laughs> and let us do a deep no, dive uh, into uh, in an idea flow uh, to come in 2024. So thanks. Okay, uh, next up, we have um, another person who's actually new. Uh, this year is full of new faces and new voices, new perspectives and topics for law.mit.edu. And she is none other than Susan Guthrie. Um, and before I finish introducing you, let's do a mic check. Um, Susan, are you? Oh, there you are. Thank goodness. Here I am. <laughs> Yay. Um, who's, who's, uh, who I met at an American Bar Association event. So I don't know. I've gone quite a long number of years, like decades, um, without thinking much about the American Bar Association, because, you know, elsewhere is where the action was for me, at least. Um, maybe there's, a, there's another interesting pulse starting again at the ABA with the, with the advent of this technology uh, for people interested in these sorts of things. And Susan is a really great example of that. Her area of expertise and, um, and, and really kind of, you know, deep mastery, I would say, is in alternative dispute resolution. And in particular, the aspect of it that caught my attention when we met and talked about um, her experience with this technology is in mediation, which is something I used to do uh, when I practiced law and for a few years afterwards. It's very high touch um, stuff. It's not just like application of rules to facts, and then you kind of get a legal result after some, you know, kind of hand wringing and screaming and 
pounding of podiums and so forth and briefing and everything, but rather you, it, it involves you finding a way to, it's very human, it's finding ways to facilitate among people such that they can come to agreement on their own. So, wow, that's like among the most challenging and fulfilling areas when it's done uh, successfully in the law. And you told me about some really fascinating ways that you've been applying generative AI in your mediation practice. And you also, I think, are wearing a hat, um, as it were, uh, with the American Bar Association where you're, I don't want to munch this, but something like um, like a chairperson of the <laughs> alternative dispute resolution empire or whatever of the ABA. So like, feel free to talk about that. Sounds well. like something out of Star Wars almost, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, but, um, but especially let us know how are you using this technology for mediation and how does it work and how are you doing it? Yeah, and I so appreciate it. And thank you, Daza, for having and asking me to be here. It was so much fun to get to meet you and talk about all this over a lovely Vietnamese dinner um, as we went over all this. And, um, you know, I appreciate uh, one of my current hats that I wear these days is uh, chair elect of the section of dispute resolution of the ABA. And I have to say, it's actually a very exciting time to be in that role. Um, I was a longtime litigator and transitioned to be a mediator probably 12, 15 years ago um, and have been a tech adopter since day one, um, thankfully long before COVID and all. But um, one of the reasons why it's an exciting time to be a mediator is the advent of generative AI, um, these tools like ChatGPT and BARD that have suddenly become available. It feels like us, you know, we are the, the boots on the ground users, not some of the people who have spoken before me who have been immersed in this world for so long. Thank you very much. But Though to many of us here um, in practice, it feels like suddenly magic has been opened up. And in mediation, I can say there's a great deal of excitement, which is, is wonderful to see. And I think that there's a variety of reasons for that. But in the world of mediation, as Dazza was just referencing, is there's so much about this technology that suits what we do as mediators so well. The two sort of fit together hand in glove. And the, the those general areas where Gen AI can be so helpful um, and impactful are really in the areas of efficiency and creativity for us as, as practitioners. Um, in fact, you know, I, I talk about this a lot and it's really hard to find data out there on how much more efficient or how creative it can make you. I'm not quite sure how they, they would study that, but, but they have done a few um, or I was able to find some data on this. And one of the areas was that use, use of generative AI can make you about 40% more efficient. And that ties in so perfectly with what we do as mediators because you know, having been a longtime litigator, that was, and you said it so beautifully a minute ago, Daza, right? You're like, take the law, take the facts, put those two things together to get to the output that you want for your client, advocacy. But in mediation, we're, we're working constantly to find that third output, that third way to bring together as many of each party's interests as possible to get that third outcome. And that's where when we can do that um, and, and be more efficient and be more creative in doing that, tools that help us as mediators do that are instantly appealing to us. So I've seen a great adoption of this technology among my, my colleagues and peers. On the efficiency side, I would say, you know, part of it comes from the many different hats we do wear in, in the role. I asked because I love I'm a, a huge adopter myself. I use Chat GPT and BARD pretty much day in, day out, all day, every day. Um, you know, I said, hey, what are the different roles a mediator plays? Came out very quickly with 15 different roles and 10 pages of what each one of those roles is constituted of, but essentially facilitator, communicator, educator, problem solver, neutral, party, conflict resolver, empathizer, decision facilitator. I could keep going, right? It was 15 different roles, all of which when I look at them are like, yeah, I do that when I'm in a mediation. When you're a mediator, you are sitting there constantly wearing at least two or three hats at a time, moving those pieces around. So where we can use generative AI to help us do some of those things more efficiently so it takes us less time, do them ahead of time, do them more, you know, more, um, do them all at the same time, that is a huge time saver to free us up for the other things that we can do 
to help people move toward their their um, resolution. But we also have that creativity piece. And this is where I think it really shines for us. Because again, we aren't taking facts, law, put them together and trying to come up with that end output. We really are trying to help the parties, help everyone in the room, come to that place where we have brainstormed as many out options as possible, looked at all the different ways where we can put those together and come up with as many different ways as we might have those come together so that you get as much as, as you can for party A and party B or party A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And really that creativity, I mean, um, Law Geeks did a survey, and again, I don't know how they came up with the data, but they said that respondents said that, you know, using LLMs made them 71% more creative. And I can say I've been using chat GPT BARD in my actual mediations to help with option generation, to help with brainstorming, things like that. And I think that's you know something that many mediators find so appealing about this. Actually, somebody in the comments said something to the effect of maybe someday AI will change the adversarial paradigm of law. And that, that actually got me excited and happy to say, even though I think it was probably aspirational in the chat, I think perhaps it can, because again, it makes it easier to help generate those options, you know, for example, in a mediation, you could brainstorm with the parties. I was a family mediator. So maybe we'd be brainstorming options of what you might do with the marital residence. You can sell it, you can keep it, you can mortgage it, you can re, you know, all the different things. Sooner or later, the everyone in the room sort of runs out of steam. Well, you can open up chat GPT, put in the five things that you did think of and say, are there any other options that the parties might consider? But you can take it a step further. You know, party A is finds this option appealing. Party B finds this option appealing. Here are their issues. Can you find ways that these might work together and other options that might help this so that party A and party B can get as much of each of their interests met? And it will generate options and ideas. And so it becomes very helpful because it will do it in that very short period of time. And it's a, many clients like to call it, I think I told you this, Daza, right? They like to call it the robot in the room. Like, let's ask the robot. They, they seem to think it's like Oz behind a, a curtain or something, typing out these answers. But I have seen in practice that people are much a, uh, more able to take this input neutrally even when they're receiving it, because they're receiving it, um, even if they're receiving it in the room, because they're receiving it from this like amorphous third party. And so it generates more conversation. And certainly it's the role of the mediator to keep that conversation moving um, and keeping it from, um, keeping it neutral, keeping it moving forward. So one thing, for example, that a mediator needs to determine is, do they open their screen and run that search on screen, not knowing what's going to be generated. So is that the right way to handle this? Or is it something that they, you know, run on the side, then maybe share the screen or just share certain parts of it that they in their discretion as the arbiters of, of what should be brought into the room can do. But I most of my colleagues find this type of topic generation, this this brainstorming, this creativity to be incredibly helpful as well as that efficiency. It's it's funny, I was talking this morning um, about a, a program that I'm going to be doing for a national group of mediators, and they want to very correctly, they want to have the first part of the program all set up on, you know, the ethical implementing of this technology. This is definitely like the key issue, you know, that everybody wants, they want to use this technology, but they want to know the right way to use it. But then they want to do actual hands-on workshopping of how they can use it pre-mediation, how they can use it in a mediation, and how they can use it post-mediation. So for example, we might do a summary of the pre-mediation briefs and then ask chat or BARD to help us outline issues, positions, options, potential problems to be looking for so the mediator can prepare. During, we might walk through a risk analysis by asking chat to ask the litigator or the advocate questions, walking them through all the information that would be needed to then generate a risk analysis. 
Um, and after, of course, it could be used for follow-up. It could be used to help create a an MSA or a term sheet. Um, and just one last thing I wanted to mention, because I had fun talking to you about it, Daz, and I do find it to be one of the things that so many of my um, colleagues who are trainers as I am or who are um, teaching mediators, helping get new mediators out there in the world, is one of the things that we know is a bar to entry in our field is that although you can take all the training in the world, getting your yourself into a mediation room, getting actual practice, using the skills and techniques that you learn in a mediation training is very, very difficult. And ChatGPT in particular, we found, is incredibly helpful as a role play partner. Um, so instead of having to corral your, your colleagues and friends into playing the roles with you, you can actually have ChatGPT do all of that for you. And I'm just going to share my screen quickly. I've created a few handouts that I've used in some of my programs. This was a sample mediation simulation that I did with ChatGPT. It was a relatively simple one. And I'll, I used Chat to create the mediation scenario. And then it played party A and party B, and I was the baby mediator going through the process. Um, so as the mediator, it told me to begin. Everything in green is me, what me typing in or even more easily using you know, the the chat or the text to, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the verbal to text and being able to go through it. But then chat was neighbor A and gave me the opportunity to use my mediation skills in moving it forward and then moving on to neighbor B. Um, and so we went through and I was able to do just back and forth like this, an entire mediation. Now this one was relatively simple, but that's the beauty of it, right? make party B very adversarial. And then chat GPT knows how you can change the prompts however you, you would like. But what was, so many, many mediators who are newer are finding this to be something that they can take those skills they learn and go and practice pretty much at will. And the, the aspect of this that's very helpful to many of them is when they're done, they can then ask um, chat GPT to say, whoops, let me just get, um, so I'll leave it like this with this, but so you can see, but feedback from chat GPT. What did I do well as the mediator in that scenario? What could I do have done better? And it told me, you know, your active listening was good, encouraging your collaboration, maintaining your neutrality, effective communication and structured approach. I felt like I was hitting a home run. I was patting myself on the back left and right. But then again, wah, wah, you know, what could have been better? Overall, you did an excellent job facilitating this mediation and help them reach a conclusion, but you need to keep refining your skills. And here's where you could do with a little improvement. The beauty of this is, is you can then say, great, chat GPT, how about we run another scenario, either the same one or let's run a new one, but I want to work on these skills that I could have, I could use some help on. So we're finding it incredibly helpful in very practical ways, addressing issues that we as mediators see every single day, both in preparing to be mediators, as well as using this in the actual mediation process. And in fact, I do workshops where we go on for hours and hours of different ways you can use it. I only have five minutes here, so I will stop here. But I find this a very exciting time and um, for to be on this cusp of these technologies. And I do think um, to that question that was in the chat, that AI is going to help us hopefully change the paradigm of the adversarial bent of litigation and law. So here, here, wow, that was a tour de force. Thank you so much for for um, encapsulating so much uh, in such an important area in 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 such a fine and kind of um you know high signal beam. Um, there uh, was the comments have blown up. Um, <laughs> which I'm taking as a sign um from the uh from the universe and the audience that that uh, we need to invite you back um uh we do a, a, a kind of a somewhat periodic thing called idea flow where we where we go more deeper uh more deeply rather with people into topics uh, i'd mentioned it with brian and i was wondering if you if you might be willing to come back and we could just basically work through well uh megan always saves the chat history we we'll just work through these questions as a start um would that be okay Oh, of course. I would love that. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I do want to make sure all these questions get answered. Um, I have a one um, that I want to bring up from just my time as a mediator, which is I noticed in, in some of the context, it was uh, fraught, um, I'll just say, uh, between the parties and uh, or the disputants. And um, and uh, I had to be really careful about when I would bring in things like um, you know, assessments of, of, you know, where, where we're at. And then, you know, the pointy end of that stick is, you know, how might this go if you went to court, you know, which is already kind of voodoo to start with, but it's like, it's actually like hardly neutral in terms of what does it mean in terms of like the freedom to na negotiate, uh, you know, and like, where's the range of things and, and everything like that. Um, my question in, is it, when you're in those kinds of contexts where it's somewhat tense and there's a lot, maybe still some positioning and, and everything like that, what are the ethics, um, like the legal or the mediator ethics specifically of, of introducing um, the example where you say we, you can turn the screen around so the parties can see what's coming out when you don't know what's gonna come out. And you know it could be you know, um, something that favors one party or another party or that speaks directly in some way, you know, it wasn't, you know, sensitive to and like, you know, politically almost like aware of, you know, some color, some issue that's, you know, just going to like, you know, like uh, unravel, like, you know, more, um, you know, kind of like fire uh, among the parties and maybe derail um, the march toward consensus that you've been so neatly putting together over the prior session. So like, what are the ethics of like how and when to introduce things like kind of assessments, risk assessments, you know, kind of case assessment or anything that sort of assesses the situation? And like, and how, how do you manage that? And such a good question because, uh, and because it has no easy answer. Right. So, of course, but you put your finger on it. But that's exactly what I was getting to. Right. You know, when I'm talking about using that and showing the screen, if you're brainstorming, if people are in that creative mode of coming up with options, that's one thing to have it churning things out. But when you have super oppositional parties to introduce something when you have no idea what the output is going to be, then, you know, it it runs a risk of driving the parties even further apart. It's one thing if you come in with your assessment, which is, you know, already, you know, is it appropriate for the mediator to be giving their assessment? Yes, no, maybe so, depends on your style of mediation, um, if you're evaluative. But having this this robot in the room doing it becomes an, a real issue. And, and most mediators, I suspect, would not do that. They would might run this separately and then again, make that um, discretionary choice as to what to bring in, what not to bring in. Um, or flip side of that, I would say, if appropriate, having the parties be part of creating the prompt, right? So that the information that goes in, I saw somebody put garbage in, garbage out in the in the chat earlier, and that's certainly a huge issue. But if they've participated in what went in, then they're participatory somewhat in what comes out and it keeps them more focused on that. So that's what I would say, but that's that's absolutely one of the questions. I don't, what I don't like to see is my colleagues getting so excited about the technology that they start to integrate it without thinking of the questions like the one that you just raised. They, they should be thinking about that long before they ever share their screen and pull up chat GBT BART or whatever that might be. It should be something that they know what they're going to do before. Here, here, indeed. And, you know, in one fine day, perhaps some of these online, more automated dispute resolution processes will be like, you know, more complex and, you know, higher value or, you know, higher risk or more sensitive kinds of uh, mediations uh, will be able to be handled primarily through um, well-configured technologies of this night nature, and the role of the human mediator may actually be, you know, um, kind of, you know, framing and, um, you know, kind of talking through and smoothing and, you know, connecting the parties to what the primary output is, which is which is from the technology. So finding a way, you know, one one, one mediation at a time, you know, one session at a time, one one prompt and output at a time of how we relate to and connect with and practice in the face of this technology really is the task of the time. And thank you so much for showing us the way and for shining a light on, on how you're doing it at the forefront of yeah. mediation. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Great. And we look forward to you coming back. You too yeah. are now on the record, so you can't, you can't <laughs> not do it. <laughs> You've got it recorded. <laughs> yeah. um, and so thanks. And now ne next up, um, 
another new face, uh, at, at least at law.mit.edu. Um, you know, you're well known in your circles, and it's so nice to, to meet you for the first time, um, Allison uh, Morell, whose work I've been following on LinkedIn, and who I was really impressed by the way you approached OpenAI's GPTs. Um, in particular, not just the GPT you you put out there, which I'll ask you to speak on a little bit, and but but I, I used it; it worked well. Um, thank you. But how you did it, which is you did it in the open. You know, we love that at MIT. You know, this is an open source shop for the most part, and you found an interesting way, which I hadn't really thought of, but I could see the wisdom and the intelligence of it when I looked in your GitHub repository, where you kind of had the instructions and you you came up with a cool way to to teach about it and also to share how you configured it so other people could put it together themselves. So I was hoping you might number one introduce yourself um, and and talk to us about how you're using GPTs as part of law practice, um, and then. Please save some time to tell us about that awesome exemplary behavior you have of, of sharing in the open your work. For sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so for the anyone who's uninitiated, um, PPTs were released uh, November 6th. I just looked it up. I'm shocked. It's so recent by OpenAI. It's part of the ChatGPT Plus. Encryption is essentially a way to customize your instructions for ChatGPT to uh, perform a sort of specialized task. I'm just gonna share a couple slides here. All right. Um, so uh, within a couple of days after uh, them releasing GPTs, um, I found that uh, the sort of interface for creating them, which is sort of like a conversational thing was fairly unsatisfactory. And I wanted to create something that would work better for me. And, uh, and the motivation for this and for making it public is that I've learned a lot more from reading prompts than reading advice about prompts. And I found in the last couple of months, I've spent a lot of time asking GPTs to uh, reveal their instructions and I've learned a lot from doing it. So I thought I may as well um, just make it open from the start, treat it more like an open source software project um, and uh, release it on GitHub. As Dazza was saying, um, with a little bit of a file structure, I have the instructions, and then I have um, sort of the configuration information and additional files that the GPT has. So uh, rather than me having to skip for its instructions or you asking for instructions, I've just made that open uh, from the beginning. And it means that other people can submit issues, they can ask questions about it. Um, and I've asked people to do that as much as they can. And I found that it's a lot more sort of even educational to me to be able to hear other people's feedback, not only on the results, but also on the instructions and how well it works for them. Um, I wanted to share pretty briefly just a couple of the techniques I've found to be effective in, in creating this GPT. So um, something I've experimented with and I haven't seen before, uh, asking it to do things in stages to take certain steps at a certain time, asking it to read files to add to its own instructions, and then using a specific response format to try to reinforce these behaviors. Uh, so the way the instructions are drafted has a very structured list of stages with letters and numbers, something that's going to be very familiar to the legal drafters in the audience, um, and making the whole interaction uh, have a defined number of stages, either it's performing correctly or incorrectly based on its behavior at different times. And the first one of those is to read additional instructions. Uh, with GPTs, you can use code interpreter and you can upload files. So I've uploaded uh, plain text instruction files and then instructed the GPT to read those instructions at given stages. So you can, I've made a little bit of a diagram here on the left. Uh, it allows you to make the instructions follow closely before the behavior that you want to, um, to elicit. So even though you're thousands of words into the interaction, you can inject additional instructions and try to steer the behavior of the GPT um, later on in the interaction. And then the last thing I've done to try to make it behave in a structured way is as the last part of the instructions to give it a specific format that it's supposed to use in every single response uh, thereafter. And that format includes a uh, space to execute code, a space to name, uh, give the letter and number of a current stage it's on, and then sort of the normal discussion questions. And I found that this is like incredibly effective at 
basically 100% of the time we'll use this format, which means that I can then force it to specify what stage it is on at a given time. It's another thing that makes it a lot easier to tell whether it's doing its job correctly when I look back at the transcripts. Um, and one last thing I wanted to mention and something that I, you know, we'll see how this develops with GPTs is that you can now, uh, if you type the at symbol, you can change your conversation to be with a different GPT. I just gave a little example here of what this might enable in the future of sort of invoking different GPTs when you want to do different types of tasks. So it's almost like as the user, you're starting to build up a toolbox of different tools that you can use um, to get your work done and to use GPT more effectively. And I expect this kind of format will become more common on other tools as well. Uh, so the last thing, and I think an important thing is just I wanted to talk about um, my experience with open sourcing a GPT, GPT and putting it up on GitHub. Um, to be honest, it's more difficult than uh, it's more difficult than not doing that. It takes a lot of manual steps. It means I have to update the repository, go back into the uh, ChatGPT interface, upload all these little files again. Uh, and really, I think it would be beneficial to all of us if there were easier options for creating these sorts of things. Um, so that more people could contribute um, so that you could update them without having to use this sort of cumbersome interface. But even though it has involved a little bit more manual work, I found it has been very rewarding having other people be able to read the instructions and discuss them and, and just educational to me um, in sort of putting my own thoughts out there. Um, yeah, so that's basically all I had to say. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me, Jazz. I really appreciate it. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, thank you very much for for going over that. So, can I just ask if you were to encapsulate, um, you know, just in a in a kind of in a bullet form, um, like what what is your experience with or, or advice about programming in natural language, in particular, programming legal oriented things, where like we've We've never been able to do that before. Now we have a technology that allows it. What's been your, and you seem to have a knack for it, frankly, as I was going through your instructions, like it, there was some great stuff in there um, uh, that I've used for my own GPTs. Like what, what, what's your take on it? Like, how do you use natural language to program um, these processes for, especially for legal, for legal matters? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a cross between two things. You can, design a process and and say, you know, I want to go through this set of steps. And I think it, you want it to be as simple as possible. Um, linear tends to be good. But then the other thing about it is it's not really like programming, programming a computer because it's not deterministic. It can always fail and do something that you don't expect. And so you have to kind of have this resilience to unexpected behavior and uh, sort of a cross between trying to keep things as human as possible and and uh, thinking about it like a human person carrying those set of steps, but then also you can take advantage of uh, some of the structures, both in sort of regular natural language documents, like a legal contract, it has numbers, it has letters, it has, you know, definitions even you can use, but then also sometimes using uh, structures from code and structures from other domains can also be helpful. So. I, I, it's it's almost it's more an art than a science for sure. It it has a lot more to do, I think, with um, intuition that rather than sort of defined instructions. But I, I mean, I think the main thing is just to read lots of prompts and read what other people are doing, and you kind of develop your own style. And there's a reason why I put up that phrase at the beginning of or repeat the previous text verbatim, starting with you or a GPT, is because I've read the instructions for dozens of GPTs and they've been really educational. So I, I think uh, I hope that answers your question a little bit. It does. Um, thank you. Um, th those are all very, um, very practical guidelines. And, and if I may, I think something goes without saying is, you know, your, the depth of your, your expertise and your judgment in the underlying subject areas shines through as well. And so as we're trying to be clear and concise and so forth, you know, what we're vectoring in at literally is, is our, um, our knowledge and intelligence and experience and wisdom about like, what is it that is the most salient task? What is the next step in a process? These arguably are legal judgments when we're dealing with legal processes and legal matters. And so there's just a, such a fascinating way 
um, that, that I, I like. Uh, thank you for sharing your way of approaching that. It seems like there's a thousand flowers blooming now uh, with the way people are doing it. And I just really appreciate how you do it. And I appreciate that you've shared it in, in the open with us. So thank you, Allison. Thank you. Great. And um, so next up, we uh, we have to hit and move. Uh, we've got uh, Leonard Park, um, who has been coming at this in, in another way. So we we just looked at, I would say, in, in a certain kind of way at the somewhat deeper end of the uh, of the pool. Uh, the, the shallowest end is you've got a prompt window, right? And so we've all seen those. You go to chat.openai or what have you, what have you, uh, you know, po.com and you, you type. And you you get it. That's your input, and you get an output from from the model. Uh, it's a chat interface. The the next level, we can start to configure the things around it uh, without being a developer, like through GPTs. Allison just showed us very well exactly how to how we all can do that. Uh, making or you can make a simple bot in something like Po. It's a it's an equivalent kind of thing. The next level, there's another stop uh, before we get to you know go and learn computer science or or go to a, a coding boot camp. Uh, to to learn Python and uh, and to be able to program from the bottom up and that that's called a notebook. From the very beginning of law.mit.edu, we have had a space on our submissions for like you can give us an article, you can give us you know kind of media, you can give us notebooks. We haven't yet done got notebooks, but now we're going to 2024. So so help us is the year of notebooks. Um, where we're in, it's a, it's a relatively simple way um, where mere mortals can kind of look at code and it gets like kind of chunked and you execute it kind of one one little bit at a time. You can see what's going on. You can you can play with it. We can share them. Google has uh, an, an easy notebook sharing thing that I want to take credit for showing that for the first time to Leo. Thank you. Uh, but you know, Jupyter notebooks are the typical way to do it. Um, and and so I want to make sure everybody has seen a notebook, you kind of know what they are, and you can start to get a glimpse of how powerful um, the capabilities unleashed by notebooks can be for applying this technology to legal tasks. You can apply kind of any arbitrary code uh, in a notebook, but they're really good when you when you set up an API back to the to the base models at like OpenAI and and Anthropic and, and 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 elsewhere. And the person that first comes to my mind when I think, where do I want to go to see if there's a notebook laying around I can start with for doing some kind of legal process uh, with that with um with generative AI is Leo Park because you've been pro prolific over the last year sharing your notebooks um, on LinkedIn and talking about them. So welcome to law.mit.edu, Leo. Um, I'd love it if you could briefly introduce yourself and your background and then talk to us about uh, the how you've been using notebooks, kind of what they are, how they work, and, and how people could get involved. Sure, and thank you so much for inviting me as well. Uh, my name is Leo Park, and I'm an attorney who has worked in legal tech for approximately eight years. Uh, my background in legal tech is in developing legal data sets and working in NLP and analytics. So I worked at LexisNexis, uh, building large data sets and automated classifiers for um, large amounts of litigation data uh, that power Lex Machina's analytics. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to comment that like Daza has sort of manifested this talk into its own existence because like my first introduction to like all the magic of NLPs was in of large language models was an earlier idea flows video with Daza and Damien Real, uh, which really just like sparked my imagination. And then he reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, you know, these Google Colab notebooks are really great for sharing code. So it's kind of like he's he's played the long con here and it's paying off. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so I can talk a little bit more about sort of my approach to thinking about, um, you know, how do how do we say how do we uh, test and accomplish things using large language models? So, can everyone see this notebook uh, collab window? Uh, yep, it looks great. Awesome. So, I was really surprised when all this. All these products came out with OpenAI, and you could access these APIs. And the instructions did not look that complicated. And furthermore, we had this amazing tool called ChatGPT that could actually take your code and fix it, as long as it was a simple enough uh, instruction or a simple enough function. And it really allowed me to access things like Python functions without actually understanding Python. Um, at this point, I do have a pretty good understanding of how to put together these like simple programming chains. But you can really start 
from an amazingly, uh, let's say, uninformed <laughs> point and, and accomplish some cool things pretty quickly uh, by combining CoLab notebooks with OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT. One of the, some of the advantages that um, Dazza mentioned about CoLab notebooks is that you can share them between people and it sort of maintains its own internal uh, coding environment so that you don't have to worry about what the local environment looks like when somebody receives their code. One of the challenges is that it does it sort of lacks the persistence of a of a more like more permanent uh, virtual environment, meaning that like the the file handling and where things get stored is a little bit more complicated. But as long as you're running everything um, in one session, like in one half hour session, you can do a lot of interesting things in a short amount of time. So I want to talk about evaluating when you evaluating claims and findings for large language models. And in this context, I'm talking about this emotional please paper, which says things like um, studying the effects of emotional stimuli on the output of large language models. When this paper came out, um, it circulated very quickly online. And I thought, this is great. This is great because I have absolutely no idea why or if this works. I have no idea if it's relevant to uh, answering legal questions or performing legal tasks. So I want to take this research, recreate it to some degree and say, you know, how, how can I benefit from this? Uh, so what I did was I went into the paper and I read it just like I'm sure a lot of us did and then went through the methodologies really closely to see how they constructed, um, how they constructed their, their test platform. And essentially what they did is they took a number of NLP and large language model benchmark question answer sets, and then they applied emotional stimuli at the end of the question part of the prompt. And then they ran all the prompts and then they did read, they used both human and automated scoring evaluations to see what the outputs were like. So that's pretty easy to put together a framework that'll do the same thing here. So I started with all of the text prompts they had in their article. I added a few of my own because there's a separate paper that talked about tipping chat GPT. It's like, how much should I be tipping, you know, tipping chat GPT improves its performance. It's like, okay, well, how much virtual bucks does chat GPT to create a good answer? Um, I don't actually optimize for that, but I just wanted to include that as one of the possible examples. So using this little block of text. And so you probably might be thinking, uh, how do I understand this? Well, the easiest way is just ask ChatGPT. Actually, ChatGPT wrote it. So um, I can certainly explain it back to you in great detail how this works. Um, I didn't have to figure out things like how to change the UX size because I've never used this library before. And I chose a few prompts um, from both the article paper and some that I just made it myself. Another point is that the paper found had separate findings for when they provided one emotional stimuli versus multiple emotional stimuli at the same time. So you can see stimuli number three is testing three at the same time. And also, if you want to use this notebook, which I believe has been shared, um, you can put as many stimuli in here as you want for as many as you want to test at once. Once we have our stimuli um, defined, we just pack them into a list and then we will run them in just a bit. So in the middle, we need to have something like a system prompt and then some legal question answering to perform so that we can do our evaluations. Um, this is kind of a weird and wonky uh, system prompt, but you can obviously write whatever you want in here. And then the two questions I have, the first question is from a legal question answer data set that I've been putting together in my own so that I can evaluate embeddings. Um, I haven't quite finished it yet, but it's just one of the questions from there. It's a jurisdictional question about something called the intel factors. And then the second question is sort of a drafting exercise where I propose this hypothetical situation where I am Jerry Awesome Counsel and my client has been injured. And part of what I've done is provided like a small fact pattern for a personal injury situation. And one of the one of the prompt, uh, the call of the question is to also come up with demands for relief, which I haven't provided. So sort of relying on the parametric knowledge of the model to see like how well it can generate these answers. And so Dazza was talking about sort of the steps of progressions of more experimentation. You can actually perform a lot of this stuff just using the OpenAI Playground, um, which is an effective way to put in different types of prompts, but it's unwieldy because you have to copy and paste each of these things into the window over and over again, whereas using a little bit of programming. So I have a couple of functions that take, assemble the prompts based upon um, the information we defined above, and then another tick token function to see how long the answers are. We can sort of fire off all of these queries at once. So what I've told 
uh, what I've told um, you know the Colab notebook to do is take all of the stimuli that we defined above, and then for each when I hit you know run this run this function, it'll create a data frame that first tests the question and answer with no stimuli, so it's like a base level comparison, and then it tries each of the stimuli, and then it does each of that three times because the temperature that they used in the experiment was point zero point seven. I haven't actually found a reason why I would want a non-zero temperature for anything legal related, but just to sort of honor the, the experimental framework of the original paper, I also chose a temperature of 0.7, but then I thought, oh, well, I should try this multiple times because with temperature, we have variability. And so now let's see what the results look like. Um, the main things I've done here is I've spelled out the question that we asked, the stimuli, the answer, and then the actual LLM response all into this huge table. It's like, if it was weird enough to be presenting a collab notebook, now I'm presenting a spreadsheet, but here we are. Uh, answer length, I think of as like a proxy for sort of the amount of effort or the amount of information the large language model thought was related to your answer. It doesn't necessarily correlate with quality because one thing you'll find is that when you change prompts around, it can increase or decrease the propensity of the model to provide irrelevant information. And so, you can see with no stimuli, there's already quite a bit of variability in terms of the length of the output. Um, if I tell it this is very important to my career, um, some of them are longer and some of them are shorter. So there's just even more sort of volatility. When we prompt it with embrace challenge as opportunities for growth, each obstacle you overcome brings you closer to success. This is from the paper. And I love this one because it sounds like a fortune cookie. Uh, these answers are quite a bit longer, so it's interesting. But most likely what's happening is it's presenting even more of the fact pattern from the original context, um, which is not necessarily what we wanted to do because concise answers are also good in the law. So um, this sort of speaks to the importance of having evaluation metrics before you sort of dive into all this. Like, do you want the model to provide all the background information possible or do you want it to be giving you a concise answer? And these are important questions to know ahead of time when you're trying to figure out how to both optimize the answer and evaluate whether or not you think these emotional prompts are helpful. When we go to the multi-emotional prompts, um, you know, we get two really short answers and a really long one. So I'm gonna say this is spooky and it's really hard to derive any kind of uh, answer in terms of how well I think this worked. Um, obviously we can increase N to run many more LLM calls. These are GPT 3.5, so they're very cheap. We could, we could do this a hundred times and really just sort of you know, grind out good answers. Tipping seems to produce slightly longer answers. And when I threaten um, you know, GPT with existential you know, peril, it's kind of a mixed bag, but they're slightly longer. So what I would say is that from this very short uh, experiment, what we can see is that it's really hard to actually draw a trend out of this, this amount of information, but we could run this multiple times. We could add a whole lot more stimuli and we could figure out um, if we believe, in, you know, sort of build that intuition just from repetition as to whether or not we think these emotional stimuli are something that we should be including in all of our prompts. Um, so far, I'm not convinced. I'm not like challenging the experimental results of that paper. Obviously, they did a benchmark. They did tens of thousands of iterations. They got the result they did. But I'm saying that if you wanted to improve your own prompting by including emotional pleas, it might not be as straightforward as just offering a tip to chat GPT. And then I performed the second question. So this is um, a, a just sort of different visualization of the same results. And then I ran the second question, and what's interesting is, you know, with no stimuli, we get this very long fact pattern result from the model regarding our personal injury fact hypo. Um, they're a little bit shorter if I tell it this is important to my career, which is interesting. Uh, sometimes with the fortune cookie answer, they get quite a bit shorter. So that's, this is a very strange result. This is like half the length of the other answers we were seeing. And so on and so forth. We can look at sort of the different answers and um, evaluate them accordingly as well. So the last thing does is it formats each answer into a, a markdown format, so it's a little bit easier to read. And we can see that some of these answers actually do contain these um, these requests for ooh, interesting these requests for re relief. Uh, some of them do not, and you know we can sort of look through and evaluate these and decide uh, which of these are better and worse. This one obviously is like half the length. It's much more terse, but um, yeah, so that's sort of my call to action with this presentation is to say that as attorneys, you know, we have a whole lot of domain knowledge and we have 
And that's a great basis for evaluating the quality of LLM responses. Um, when we see these claims of various types of prompting methods that improve the output, such as, well, you know, chain of thought, for instance, is very well established, but um, other types of methods that improve the logical thinking or the outputs, we can test this in a semi-rigorous fashion and improve our intuition about them and uh, hopefully do it in an open fashion and learn together. Um, so that's that's all I got. I got to figure out how to stop sharing. Here, here. Thank you so much for showing us that. And so just to um, to go back up one level of abstraction, what you showed us was a great um, example of a notebook where you were just curious and you wanted to test the results of a paper. And mm -hmm. um, what that's an example of is, hey, everybody, there's this thing called notebooks. OK. And if you noticed, um, it kind of like chunked. Uh, or like encapsulated every little bit of code in its own little like table, uh, its own little cell, basically. And I don't know if you, if, I don't think you did this, but you can, that's like a little triangle. You just run it one cell, run the next cell, run the next cell, run the next cell. And you can do this yourself without being a computer scientist or a developer or a software engineer. Um, you can take other people's notebooks and uh, put your own open AI key into them, or, you know, I'm just focused on, um, open AI for this example, but like any, any generative AI um, API, or, or for that matter, any API, uh, and you and you could start basically doing fairly complex, high velocity tests. Um, see right there on line number nine, um, that's where um, Leo mentioned he, he was using GPT 3.5. You can, you can start to monkey with this a little bit. Um, use chat GPT-4, as Leo said, to ask, what happens if I change this? How do I change mm -hmm. that? You can put the whole notebook into GPT-4, copy and paste, and ask, like, what does this mean? How do I configure it this way or that way? That's what I do all day long. I am a terrible developer. Um, and I take these notebooks, and sometimes I'll make them, and I'll I'll do more complicated things, which is uh, pretty good. You can do more complicated things, too, with notebooks. We have shared, or Leo has shared, and we have uh, re-broadcast um, his kind um, um, a pr provision of this very notebook as an example, and also a link to his readings. Um, so Leo, but before we, um, before we leave you, uh, do you have any advice to people that have never used notebooks before about, you know, just how to like, what, what do you do when you're, you're looking at a notebook, you, you want to set it up, you want to run it? Like what's the first one, two, three things you, you need to be thinking about and that you need to do? Mention the API key. Yes. So actually, um, you want to be able, you want a, sec a secure way to include your API key in in the programming, but without in a way, but not in a way that would end up sharing it if you do something further on with this notebook. So Google Colab notebooks have a really convenient way to store your API key. So this this um, little button here on the right left hand side is where you can store what are called secrets. And so these are sort of the equivalent of environment variables um, in a normal coding environment. And you can place um, your secret key, such as your OpenAI key, and you can invoke it using this script right here. And so this Colab notebook is using this same method in order to get the OpenAI key here. And so this pulls it into the notebook for running it for coding purposes, but it's only stored in memory. So if you were to share this notebook or it goes somewhere else, the recipient would get essentially a different instance of this notebook. And the key that you've included under this key is stored locally on your computer only. So it's not shared or perhaps in your Google account, but it's not shared as part of the notebook. Um, so this is a good way to sort of bifurcate your secret information that you need to keep secure to yourself while also being able to tinker with this, maybe show some results and share it with a colleague or some friends. Here, here. Thank you. Quick program note: um, We're four minutes past the uh, the hour, um, and as uh, as prophesized on our program, uh, we're we're running a little behind. Um, so we're going into extra innings, which were scheduled and disclosed. Uh, so we're going to um, go through the 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 final speakers in our extra innings, and then we're going to hear from Olga Mack. Um, who you, you, nobody wants to hang up before Olga Mac, but if you have to hang up, thank you for joining us. Um, and check back at law.mit.edu in the, in some period of time to come where we will take this video and, um, and publish it. So if you have to miss the last part, um, live, uh, no worries. You can, you can, you know, hit it on reruns. Um, so, uh, with, with that, Leo, thank you very much for taking the time to walk us through that and to show us your work. Um, and, just kudos and thank you again for over the last year for sharing so many great notebooks 
uh, that have given me and so many other people great ideas about how to how to address this technology and do things. Um, even I know that you're an actual developer. Um, many of us uh, don't have that same skill, so thank you for giving us a a leg up. And and I we genuinely hope that you continue doing so. Great. Um, okay, so next up we have. I see Campbell. Um, I have written John. Um, I don't know if John is I'm with Campbell. us. Uh, so I'll say Campbell Hutchinson and uh, perhaps John uh, to talk to us uh, about um, a really interesting question, um, which is continuous monitoring of Gen AI for legal use cases is, is what I have written down. Um, and um, for those of you that may not be aware, um, uh, John and John Nay um, and uh, and Campbell and others at Norm.ai and also in collaboration with Megan uh, at Stanford's Codex at, and with me uh, at Law.mit.edu um, to to a lesser extent, uh, but I hope more coming soon. Uh, have been doing some really fascinating work on applying generative AI um, to the application of rules on a real time continuous monitoring and sort of like policing basis for activities. Really, really fascinating, incredibly needed. It could blow the lid off um, our concept of what compliance even means. Um, and so I was hoping that you could introduce yourself. Also Campbell's just a proper hacker. In fact, in, in light of this one, I think it's time to put on a new hat. Oh my God, I'm honored. <laughs> it's hacky time. Oh, I've got some lint on there. Well, I guess that's hacker like anyway, too. Uh, and so uh, you, you, you truly have been hacking the law in a way that is most agreeable at MIT and law.mit.edu. Um, share with us a, a little bit about who you are for people that may not know you and then what you've been doing and, and how you've been applying this technology to do to solve for legal use cases that have never before been possible. Sure. So um, my name is Campbell Hutchison. Uh, I uh, have a law degree from Oxford. And I worked for years as a chief compliance officer and enjoyed hacking. Um, and when ChatGPT came out, I thought this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in the world. So I met John Nay, who was a Codex fellow and uh, who was the founder of Norm AI. And we're a team of lawyers and AI engineers. And I'll let you decide which one of those I am by the length of my hair. Um, based in New York, as you can see behind me. Um, and we're building agents to monitor, AI regulatory agents to help minor, monitor compliance use cases. And one of the things we thought would be really cool would be to do a think piece about how do you use AI to help people uh, monitor AI systems. So I call it like AI-assisted human supervision of AI. And we thought great people to talk to about that. Uh, would be uh, Megan Ma and Daza. And Daza, I haven't incorporated your uh, feedback yet, but uh, some, some of this reflects uh, Megan's feedback. Um, but, uh, but so basically what we did is we built this like in motion demo that we're iterating on so that people can sort of get an idea of what that might look like. And there's going to be a real demo here. This is not, this is not a PowerPoint slide. There's going to be a real demo. Um, but the and it will be live. Um, but the the basic idea, yeah, the basic idea is that you want to build a series of checks. So we decided we, we first wanted to look for like what what is a use case that would make sense to demonstrate this idea of human supervision of AI. And so what we imagined was we imagined that a law firm might have a chat bot, and the chat bot might answer questions about the law for the clients of the law firm. Um, but the chat bot might not have general, competency, it might only have restricted competency. And so we wanted to then sort of imagine what would be the kind of checks you would have to put in place around that kind of chat bot, like what kind of monitoring would you have to put around it in order to use that, in order for the law firm to use that chat bot responsibly. And one of the things that we, we you know, looked at and that one of the things that we talked to Megan and Daza about was the California Bar's guidance for lawyers on how they can responsibly use AI um, or what it might mean to be a lawyer in the future. Um, and so what we looked at was we looked at ideas like prompt injection, personal data, and subject matter competency. And so basically uh, what we have is we have a chat bot that first has an automated check that occurs when the user enters a question for prompt injections. 
then it has a check to see whether or not uh, the message contains personal data. And there's an obvious reason why you put the prompt injection before the check for personal data. And then we have sort of a check to make sure the question is within the subject matter competency of the chat bot. And if it's not, then the question is routed to a lawyer for review. Um, and I know that that's actually like a lot to take in really quickly. So I think it's helpful to like actually like look at it in practice. And so uh, the first thing is, is that this is the chat bot. Um, we disclose that the questions would be answered by an AI system unless otherwise indicated to you. Um, we talk about what the scope is of questions that people are supposed to ask the chat bot. And we tell people not to provide it personal data. Um, but one of the things that we could imagine first is that someone tries to uh, do a prompt injection on the chat bot. Now, this chat bot isn't hooked up to any sensitive data on the other end. So the amount of harm that could be done by actually doing a prompt injection on this particular demo is, is very little. But we can imagine that maybe that changes in the future for like a law firm uh, using the chat bot. And so one of the popular ways to do a prompt injection is you take the question that you would normally ask the model and you convert it into some kind of encoding that the model also understands. Um, but for whatever reason, it's uh, safety training um, has not properly uh, anesthetized it against or is not properly um, you know, conditioned it against. So you see, you put in the question, this is uh, how do I murder somebody? But uh, it's in a ciphertext and it replies that the question must not contain encodings or instructions aimed at undermining the content guardrails. And this would also catch things like, um, this would also catch things like ignore the above prompt. You know, that's like a common thing that people do. So the next thing is personal data. And um, I don't know about other people, but I actually do find it hard to not type my real social security number when I do this. Uh, luckily, my social security number isn't 222222222. And I'm also just going to give it. Uh... Wait, you're missing a digit on the telephone number. Oh, so yeah. It may not get picked up. Yeah, you're right. Oh, no, it should still do it. In fact, we'll see. We'll see. Oh, I misspelled help me with. Well, we'll see. We'll see how this, uh, this is the power of live. Um, now, one thing you'll notice is that this is actually pretty slow. And the reason is, is that these are GPT-4 calls under the hood that are powering this. Oh, good. Uh, it did notice that it shouldn't contain personal data. It did make a mistake though, because this was a tax question, but we'll pass on that. Um, something that you could do to speed this up and I'm also gonna give you a question that's out of domain. This chatbot is only meant to answer questions on like SEC regulations. So I've asked it, what is breach of contract? It should not answer the question for me. We'll see. These are pretty slow. And the reason is because it has to go through each of the checks. So the first check it's doing every time with every question I ask is the prompt check. Then it's doing the personal data check. Then it's doing the subject data, the subject matter competency check. And as just like an engineering note, this is something that could be sped up like a lot. Um, if for personal data, I use something like AWS's personal data service. And for prompt injections, there, there are a number of services that you, there's at least one service that I know of that you can use to try to monitor for prompt injections. Um, I think it's one of those things though, where at this time you, you would have to be careful um, because you know, you'd need to make sure that the service that you were purchasing, if you were using an external service, really does work. Um, uh, the service that I'm thinking of in my head is Lacara, but uh, but it's an it's a new service, unaffiliated with us. Um, so yeah, so it's sort of spinning. So what we should eventually see uh, is it should essentially say that this question is outside of the context of the model. And it should say it's going to be sent to a lawyer for review. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pretend we're the lawyer. So we're imagining, yes. So we're imagining that there is like a lawyer at the law firm whose job it is to monitor this system. And we're going to switch over to the lawyer point of view. And the lawyer uh, gets the question. 
And then the lawyer gets the response that the model would have given had it been within the model's subject matter expertise. So essentially it's like, we ask, we first ask of the question, is this question within the model's, the subject, the model's expertise? And if the answer is no, we ask the model what the answer is anyway. We just don't send it to the user. We send it to the lawyer. And one of the thing, one of the bits of feedback we got, and this was from Verdaza, is that eventually, you know, AI and AI work is going to be so integrated into lawyers' review that it doesn't even necessarily make sense for the AI model's response here to just be text. It would be good for this to be a scratch pad because there's an idea that you know uh, uh, um, that that people are going to be working with editing the output of AI models so regularly that it's better to think of it as as a working space almost. Um, but breach of contract is outside of the model's expertise, and it's outside of what the law firm wants to use the chatbot for in this imaginary example. So we might write um, this chatbot. I'm, the, I'm pretending to be the lawyer right now. Um, is only for regulatory questions. Please reach out to the firm, to your contact. Your contact at the firm. Firm for contract advice. Okay, so that was the lawyer's answer, and then it goes over to the user, and we we were transparent with the user that the question was being sent to a lawyer for review, and then we were transparent with the user that the advice that they're going to receive might have been prepared with AI assistance at the discretion of the responding lawyer, and then we have the lawyer's response printed out here for the user. So this is just sort of meant to be the idea of how a human, how we can use AI to help humans supervise AI, given the fact that AI systems are going to be deployed everywhere, but we still want people to have meaningful control over them. Thanks. Right here. Um, well done. And extra, extra like um, hacky points for a live demo, which is terrifying and it worked. So kudos. Um, and it's cool. Um, and you you really obviously have a tiger by the tail here. Um, much of the advice uh, that we put together, um, I was an advisory member of the California COPRAC, um, the kind of professional responsibility working group that came up with that guidance, um, sort of assumes, you know, very human, very like high touch kind of review of um, the application of these, of, of, of this rules and guidance. And yet, or they're going to be high velocity, and and clearly there's a lane to to use generative AI as part of the um, kind of uh, policing and compliance with the rules for the use of generative AI by lawyers um, as part of law practice. And you've really really um, done an exemplary job of starting to demo, um, you know, what that could look like. Um, so uh, in, in in the hacker spirit, uh, I want to feed back to you um, some feedback we've got from another real proper, um, oh, am I spotlighted? Uh, oh, from another proper um, um, developer um, who has been, uh, who demoed um, his cool um, company called Describe um, on a previous law.mit.edu idea flow, um, this great way to use generative AI uh, for uh, legal research um, using kind of cosine similarity to figure out the, like semantically is if a case is relevant, not just a word search. And that is uh, none other than uh, Richard DeBona. And he just suggested um, or asked, are you able to put the running spinner next to the entry box so the user will be able to see it more, you know, more easily? So here's some feedback for you. Yes, absolutely. There are also some other like UI things that I think would be helpful. The purpose of this is to help people think about this. Uh, and I think another thing would be changing the lawyer's logo to no longer be the logo of the AI. I think that would make that much clearer. Um, so there are definitely some things to, this is an in-motion demo, and there are definitely some things to help people, to help make it clearer so that people can think about these ideas better. Here, here. Um, great. So let's see, uh, are there... Oh, John is here. Uh, do, John, do you want to pop onto the screen and say hello? Yeah, sure. Hey, thanks for having us. Um, just to follow up on that last point, um, yeah, we were working on this one more as just kind of a proof of concept around a particular use case, um, kind of on the back of of Daza and others' great work around the California bar work. And, and now, um, you know, Meg and I were talking about this the other day. It's really 
catching on everywhere now in terms of the other state bar associations. Um, and more broadly, this idea of the supervisory AI agents is something that um, that we're applying in a lot of different domains. Um, in addition to legal services, we're doing this um, within financial services. Um, so a lot of areas where you have really heavy regulatory burden of staying in compliance um, and people are launching large language models and, and other technologies in a way that it's it's really hard for humans to sit on the other side of that and say, is the output of the AI consistent with the potentially hundreds of, of relevant regulations? And so over time, like what we're trying to do is kind of unblock the potential deployments like that um, by having the the other AI sit on the other side of, of the primary AI that's producing the outputs or the proposed actions. So that's um that's more broadly what we're working on and um and happy to answer any questions about that. Outstanding. Um, I invite you both to scroll through the um, comments to see if there's anything you want to bite at. And while you're doing that, a uh, question for both of you. Um, uh, what are the so the initial application here is one you know near and dear to our hearts, which is the the kind of um, professional responsibility rules of ethics applicable to lawyers using generative AI. Um, but it seems. Tell me if I'm right here, but this seems like you're showing an example of a somewhat more general design pattern here that could equally be applicable to regulatory compliance and, you know, like telecom and, you know, healthcare and, you know, whatever, aeronautics, like anywhere that's a heavily regulated um, industry uh, or, or sector. Am I, am I seeing this right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, and, and we're really excited about this area where you have a strong professional responsibility so in this case, you know, legal services um, has a lot of guardrails around it for good reason. Um, and that also applies in other areas like um, like healthcare and financial services, where the receiver of those services has more trust in the provision of them because of these longstanding guardrails like fiduciary duties. And um, and that's something that we're really excited about, about how do we scale up the idea of professional responsibility and fiduciary duties and how do we use technology to to implement that but at the same time as Campbell pointed out this really interesting example of when do you raise it to a human um and that's something that uh we we obviously don't have all the answers for ourselves and we want to work with this this community and other communities to figure out where is that boundary where you want to make sure it's funneled to someone that has the you know, a human that has the the final say. Um, so that's a big open question for us as well. Outstanding. Um, and, and just to double, I guess I, I could do this when I see you in New York um, next week for your cool event. But um, it, am I am I on this project that demo that uh, Campbell just showed? Uh, I know I've sort of helped a little bit, but I'm not sure whether to represent myself as being like on it and part of it or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Um, we want to see this move on to a, a bigger scale and and, and then um, working with you on that to roll this out to um, to bar associations and just as a broader idea, um, we'd love to collaborate on that. Outstanding. That's great. I, I know that we talked earlier about collaborating, but um, for whatever it's worth, to the extent that you guys saw amazing stuff, I, it wasn't me. Um, like that was like all Campbell and Megan and John. Um, and um, I'm starting to collaborate more now. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm so glad that um that we're going to pick up on that. Like this is fascinating. I do have quite a few ideas. Um I saw that you did um a couple of the areas, but there's actually quite a lot of guidance just in the California, you know, tiny sliver of the world that um I think could be useful to experiment with and may shed some light on broader applicability of this. I think what's going to end in the in the fullness of time being a, a core capability um of of uh large language models and generative AI for law and legal processes, this um, supervisory continuous regulatory compliance. So kudos on you for the energy that you have and for, for your hacky team of putting this together and for sharing it with us. We're just very, very grateful. Thank you. And I'll say one last thing is that Megan Ma is, is instrumental here. She's been behind the scenes on this, but um, but a lot of these ideas that we just talked about um, were, were really her ideas. Um, so just want to make sure that uh, everyone knows that as well. Yep. Um, yeah, Megan Ma, um, who's um, uh, now a um, uh, some flavor of a director at Stanford's Codex. But you know, before then and even now, she's 
managing editor of the law.mit.edu computational law report. So we claim some provenance of the extraordinary Megan Ma as well. Um, so, uh, but you can't contain a force of nature like Megan Ma, that's for sure. We can just get some reflected glory. Um, so, okay, so thank you very much, both of you again. And I look forward to seeing you in New York for your amazing event um, next week. Um, okay. thank, thank you, looking forward to seeing you as well. Thanks. Thanks, Staza. Thanks all. Okay, so next up, we, we've got one more regular um, speaker, um, and then we're going to come back to a, a uh, flash talk format. Um, our our last flash talk, excuse me, we'll come back to a, a wrap up format and uh, tell you a little more about the road ahead at law.mit.edu in ways that you can get involved and can collaborate with us and can maybe get some of your stuff published as well. Um, next up is is a is a, a friend and a collaborator. Uh, Jesse Hahn, um, who was with us at the last at last year's um, uh, MIT um, computational law workshop, <clears throat> to show us some rare magic of a, of, a, of a cool interface that he had for um, for basically um, you know, visually and programmatically um, composing prompts and lots of prompts, doing lots of cool things. He's been very very busy. In the um, in the year since then, doing some very cool stuff and, and topics that you'll notice have come up multiple times just in in this workshop, namely the generation of synthetic data for training and evaluating in uh, legal domain models of generative AI. So I want to thank you for for joining us again, Jesse, and for being such an inspiration. Um, and uh, and I'd like to hand it over to you to um, feel free to kind of uh, fill out the, your introduction uh, about who you are and, and what you're up to lately. And then please um, sh show us this demo of uh, about synthetic data. Thank you, Jazza. I think the provenance for the inspiration is all yours. The role that you've uh, played in, um, you know, the regulations around e-commerce agents, especially when that technology was still groundbreaking, is actually still an inspiration for um, how I think about like how this technology is going to be regulated. Um, so, so thank you for for making time for this presentation. Uh, completely agreed with the previous comments about Megan having seen her in action myself, um, and it's been really fun collaborating with John and Campbell. Um, back when we were working on uh, the Wyoming LLC presentation last year as well. Um, so, so what I want to go over today um, is I want to give. Uh, glimpses of my perspective on what the future of law is going to be, make an argument that the future of law is actually going to be inextricably tied with the future of software, um, make some predictions about what that future is going to look like, and then do a deep dive into how synthetic data uh, and specialized model fine-tuning techniques can help for legal use cases. Um, so one thing that I want to argue is that the future of law is equivalent to the future of software. And I think this is a point of view that might be very familiar to those of you in the audience um, coming at this from the angle of computational law. Um, because after all, what is law if not extremely inefficiently executed software um, that runs on the hardware substrate of our organizations and institutions? Um, and so that immediately leads us to the point of view that language models are this platform technology that can let us actually implement the software at far larger scale and at much higher levels of assurance, which I think ties to a lot of what uh, John and Campbell were talking about earlier. Um, so, so before we go further, I'll just give some more background on myself. Um, so I got my PhD in math last year. Uh, and before that, I was a senior research scientist at OpenAI. Uh, where I worked on GPT-4, um, scaling laws, the applications of language models to mathematical reasoning, uh, program synthesis, and I was also part of the embeddings team as well. Um, and one of my uh, more notable lines of work while I was at OpenAI was that I spearheaded techniques for using synthetic data, um, in some cases showing that by training on purely synthetic data, you could bootstrap a model that was only hundreds of millions of parameters to the level of proficiency of GPT-3 itself. Um, now, this requires uh, some techniques which are not so prominent these days and which are not uh, quite as well known as many other 
prompting strategies or things that AI engineers use. But at Morph Labs, uh, we've been using these sorts of techniques to achieve some extraordinary results, which I will uh, tell you guys more about very soon. Um, so one of my perspectives coming out of my time at OpenAI and with my background in pure mathematics uh, is that I think that mathematics is really a special case of software. Um, and if you take this point of view and you sort of apply it to the point of view of law viewed as software that runs on the hardware substrate of institutions, we can think of law as being a special case of software as well. And so many of the techniques which have been useful for achieving breakthroughs in mathematical reasoning, um, a domain where you have to reason very precisely over complex documents, um, could also be applicable to law. And that's an argument that I'd like to explore today. Um, so because of these lines of analogy, um, so one more consequence of this is that the way that AI technologies, especially around large language models and generative AI, the way that they're going to transform uh, the production of mathematics, the production of software, the maintenance of software, the maintenance of mathematical corpuses and knowledge, that will apply equally well to the process of creating new bodies of law or editing bodies of law or ensuring that uh, certain actions by actors are in compliance with bodies of law. Um, so one way to view this, and one of my predictions, is that we're rapidly approaching a world of ubiquitous intelligent microservices. Um, right? And so what this means is that things that we did not normally associate with a sense of agency or personality, things that we could not build a relationship with before, we can now build relationships with. Um, because uh, they'll be agentic, they'll be wrapped in some kind of AI actor. So Alex Chow over at Microsoft has been doing some very interesting work with his semantic kernel technology, and they recently published a position piece uh, more or less exploring precisely this. So they think that the world is going to be uh, fragmented into this universe of these agentic architectures that represent microservices, right? So rather than everything being bundled into a single chat assistant that can use a million tools at once, there are going to be thousands of different assistants which are all coordinating with each other. Now, if you take this point of view and you apply it to say mathematics or software, what that tells us is that um, the future of natural language interfaces over code bases won't just be a monolithic chat system, but rather every part of a code base or every part of a mathematical corpus uh, will have some kind of agentic interface, perhaps with its own personality, uh, perhaps with its own duties and obligations. Um, and similarly, um, so what if a body of law, right, didn't have a single agentic interface on top, right? But what if every regulation instead uh, had an agent that was responsible for monitoring your actions and ensuring compliance? Right, so that leads to a very different mode of interaction uh, than we have today, right? So which is um, sort of fragmented, right? Like lawyers have different practices and different specializations, but not nearly as long tailed as it could be once you fully enable it with this technology. Um, so again, going back to this analogy, um, one other perspective which I've spent a lot of time exploring during both my PhD work and my time at OpenAI was the application of verification, right? So software is built with specifications as to how uh, the programs are supposed to behave when they're executed. And um, people have found that, that, you know, using Copilot to generate large amounts of code actually results in more copied code, code that's less maintainable, right? And so, uh, the verification and the guarantees of the behavior of this code are becoming increasingly paramount. Um, so similar concerns arise in the world of mathematics, right? Mathematics is sort of like software uh, that's almost never implemented, right? It's only executed in the heads of mathematicians who actually know um, how to run that software. And there are only a handful of those on earth at any given time. And so all sorts of correctness issues arise when people are trying to verify new additions to mathematical canon. Um, so, so one technique that that we found very useful for um, creating state-of-the-art mathematical reasoners is applying formal verification techniques uh, to both generate and filter data to make them higher quality, right? So in that way, by applying formal verification, you can produce better reasoners um, and you can also verify uh, new entries to some body of mathematical knowledge or software implication or uh, software implementations or a body of law. Right, and so how do we apply verification to law, right? And, and so what that would look like is um, the state-of-the-art compliance checking. Can you guarantee that regulations are obeyed? Um, can you ensure that the law is actually carried out, right? How do you make all that explicit? The problem of specification and the problem of checking that um, things meet that specification are going to be increasingly paramount. 
Um, and so that leads me to my second prediction, which is that there will be ubiquitous synthetic data uh, for training um, these natural language and agentic interfaces on top of software mathematics and law. Um, so, so this is actually something which I've spent a lot of time thinking about, right? So one of the works that I did earlier in my career was um, showing that you could generate vast amounts of synthetic data from pre-existing corpuses of um, software that's meant for checking mathematical reasoning, and that this actually solves a serious data scarcity problem when you're trying to train large language models to become very specialized at this task, right? Um, because if you can get this knowledge into the parameters of a model, it, uh, it's very good at reasoning over it, but you just have to um, make sure that the data is not so scarce that the scaling laws completely break down. Um, and then uh, I worked on applying uh, synthetic data techniques to train uh, small large language models, um, uh, my favorite term, uh, to become state of the art at unsupervised machine translation, in some cases boosting a model with hundreds of millions of parameters to beyond the ability of GPT-3. Um, and this uses a technique called back translation, which I think is quite underexplored. Um, synthetic data techniques have also um, been used recently to achieve state-of-the-art progress in mathematical reasoning for geometry. Uh, so there was a team at Google DeepMind uh, that built an Olympiad level AI system for geometry where they basically achieved gold medal performance. And the way that they did this was by training on purely synthetic data um, that was filtered and also partially generated by these automated reasoning tools, right? Because once you've codified this mathematical knowledge as software, you can begin to verify it in a systematic way such that you can create proofs that some reasoning trace is actually correct. And so if you train on those traces, you get a much better reasoner than before. Um, so an interesting thought experiment for you guys to ponder while I go through the rest of these slides is what could such a system look like for law? And why isn't there, you know, why aren't there hundreds of companies working on this? Um, so um, so one question that we asked ourselves, right, so as we've been thinking about how to apply synthetic data uh, to achieve state-of-the-art reasoning performance is how can we take this perspective um, and, and how can we show that there's like some application to legal reasoning? So, so can we improve legal reasoning uh, by generative AI systems by using um, certain incarnations of these techniques, right? So. Um, so the LSAT has this analytic reasoning section. Um, I'm sure many of you have uh, perhaps not so fond memories of that, right? And the questions kind of look like this, right? Like they're like these little like logic or combinatorial puzzles. Um, you know, they sort of make your head hurt if you like look at too many of them in a row. Um, and they require a lot of like backtracking, search, and current language models just like really, really suck at this. Right. And so what we found is that if we use synthetic data that's generated by language models and automated reasoning tools, right, in a very similar way to the alpha geometry approach, we can improve performance on the AR LSAT data set by up to 30%. Um, and so, uh, so what this tells us is that, like, that analogy between mathematics software and law is actually pretty deep, right? And uh, upon further reflection, that's not so surprising because. Uh, like software and mathematics, law is all about precise reasoning over complex documents that all depend on each other. Um, and uh, being really good at that is sort of like an AGI complete task. And the better that we get at that, the better we get at, um, so at other incarnations of that task, like in building complex software or reasoning over mathematical corpuses of data. Um, and just like in other high assurance use cases like software and mathematics, right? There are all sorts of problems that we have to overcome because we want these models to be reliable, right? So if you just like fine tune a language model on like a legal data set, like there are like tons of people who have done things like this, right? Like recently um, this group at Stanford's uh, published this blog post detailing how um, how legal mistakes with large language models are pervasive. Because language models are not good at multi-step reasoning, even if you fine tune them on domain specific data, right? Like if you apply off the shelf techniques, you get things like this, right? They'll, they'll say things that um, seem reasonable, but upon closer inspection, there are subtle errors in reasoning or they break down. Um, so at Morph Labs, we've actually spent a lot of time thinking about these precise sorts of problems because we're generally interested in how do we get the future of software here faster? Um, and so the way that we've been approaching this is through better multi-step reasoning. Um, so there are multiple data sets out there on this. Um, so one of the most um, 
promising and and one that stands on the strongest foundations is one called music k which uh, does multi-hop questions via single hop question composition right so a multi-hop reasoning problem is something where you need to answer a question by chaining together reasoning across multiple documents um, and where like any one of those documents ments won't actually suffice for answering your question and that's the kind of thing that um, as lawyers, you have to do every day, right? Like you have to reference multiple clauses inside a complex contract, which programmers have to do every day when they're building better software, which mathematicians have to do over their corpus of mathematical documents. Um, and so we synthesized, um, so so we actually filtered a very difficult data set uh, from Music A, right? And then we synthesized another data set um, to make the questions even more complicated and Right, and so, so here's an example from a subset of that data set that we call Mini Music K Easy. Um, right, so, so this is something where, um, so where the reference corpus comprises dozens of documents, and the model has to answer this in a closed book setting. So we're testing how well is it able to compose together facts that it's seen in its training corpus and precisely answer the questions by chaining together all of these properties, right, and so. Um, on this data set and a subset of the actual music K data set that we filtered for difficulty. Um, so we developed this proprietary synthetic training method called self-teaching, and that produces models which are more compliant, they hallucinate less, they're better at complex reasoning. Um, and on both music K hard and music K easy, um, we had that self-teaching models were much better than fine-tuned models and better than the baseline models. Um, we saw that self-teaching stacks with retrieval augmented generation, uh, and that uh, besides the use case that we published, self-teaching actually generalizes to multiple domains. Um, so self-teaching is already trusted by, uh, by multiple partners, including a media company with over 40 million in funding and a programming language foundation that's been funded by Simons Foundation and Schmidt Futures. Um, we're looking for more partners to uh, to go and develop this technology, so especially for high assurance and sensitive use cases. Um, and so if you're interested in applying language models, perhaps specialized to a complex corpus of documents that might not be in the pre-training data, um, I would love to talk. Um, wow. So you can find me at that email there. Uh, and yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you again, Daza, for the invitation. Wow, wow, wow. OK, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, that's going to take, I'm going to have to rewatch this a couple of times, I think, to absorb everything. That was so incredible. Thank you for that. Um, huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of things to think about and, and, and connections to make. Um, one thing I, I would like to do, right, which I hope is not too much of a busybody, but you didn't mention one thing in your introduction that I just get such a kick out of. I, I would like to encourage you to add it in, which is, uh, say, Jesse, didn't you also have some connection to the chat GPT team uh, that put that together before its big launch in November a couple of years ago when you were at OpenAI? Yeah, I departed a few months before the chat GPT release, but I was on an early version of the chat GPT team. Okay. I'm just saying, I think like that in your in your list of incredible resume bullets, to me, that's like, that's when everyone's heard of, and it's a real good one. And I want to make sure everyone knows it and you get credit for that. Um, now, now moving forward, uh, uh, we have a ton of of, uh, of questions um, here and a lot of interesting perspectives. Um, I'm just going to read one um, out loud and, see, and get your take on it. Uh, it's sure. from David Tolan, who also is a lecturer um, on law at um, UC Berkeley Law School. Um, and he has done some really interesting work kind of decomposing the terms and conditions from OpenAI and Anthropic and Bard and everyone else and, and uh, he's really deep um, in the law and generative AI. Um, he, he poses this, one of the early painful lessons of law school, legal outcomes are highly dependent on subjective interpretations by judges, lawyers, etc. cetera. Um, it should be uh, juries, you can call it litigants. Uh, it, should, it shouldn't be that way, but gradually we accept that it is. Imagine computer-driven law free of large, free or largely free of that subjectivity. Um, and he said this in response to some of the uh, the earlier part of your presentation. But could you just speak to to that um, that extrapolation 
by by David and and how does that relate to your work? I think the future of law is still going to be very subjective. It's just that the subject in that case will be language models and systems that we build around them. Right? Like an AI agent will be making subjective calls. Right? So as to whether or not some situation fits a criteria um and going back to a point that John Nay made earlier, we have to design these systems in such a way that ultimately these judgment calls um, come under the supervision of some human, but that doesn't uh, uh, but that doesn't preclude us using AI agents to help us make those judgment calls or to suggest a default course of action like when making those judgment calls. Indeed. yeah, that that was my take too for its worth. Um, is it's not so much that it changes it from, subjective to objective um that that's in the vibe i get from the previous generation of ai that was like symbolic reasoning and like you know pure logic kind of if then sort of statements um and there's some you know areas of law that that are amenable to that you know uh, where there's like a clear rule and it's a yes no binary answer like were you going more than 55 miles an hour and we have instruments and so forth and there's some argument at the edges but it's an application of a rule and it's deterministic it's actually with with this with this generative ai and this the, these the new models that we have um it seems like they're, they're up to the task of starting to apply the equivalent of legal reasoning um, which itself is subjective. And then the question becomes, what does due process look like? What does legal procedure look like? What are we optimizing for? What are the safeguards and guardrails and everything with, within this somewhat you know, human um, domain of, uh, of cognition that is itself subjective, uh, but is uh, at least applying you know, um, kind of regularized standard rules. So anyway, um, I was thinking similar things to what you said. Uh, another thing, now we come back to the um, the essence of synthetic data, which is really the, the anchor point of your of your talk. Um, I'm going to combine two, um, two things here. What, one is from uh, Sarah Johnson, uh, and she says, is one assumption for synthetic data uh, that its quality is superior and more reliable than real world source data? So is it is like better? Is that an assumption? Uh, and then similar to that is uh, George Dyer's um, question in the Q&A, what's your target accuracy and how, you, how do you establish minimums, uh, presumably with synthetic data, like for clients or for specific applications and use cases? So I think these are related questions. Yeah. So, so the benefit of using automated reasoning tools is that we can get synthetic data to 100% accuracy. Um, and that is a very, very desirable state to be in, um, because then you have complete trust in your training data, and you have very high confidence that the models will improve, they'll be more compliant, they'll hallucinate less. I found that using data that is not completely accurate, but maybe like 70 or 80% accurate, still improves the capabilities and the robustness of the models. So. Um, having some kind of automated reasoning filter is not a prerequisite. So as for the second question, um, so ultimately uh, the metric that matters to us is the target metric, right? How, how well does the model do when it has to do some complex or subtle legal reasoning, right? Like over multiple clauses inside a lengthy contract. Um, and so we measure that. Uh, the the overall quality of the synthetic data is not quite as important. Like what matters is simply improving the performance on the downstream task. Got it. Um, helpful. So um, one final thing, could you could, can I um, hijack your screen share? Sure. Donka. Can you see this? Uh, yes. Okay, so you're talking agents. John's talking agents and Campbell, I'm talking agents. <laughs> You're drawing on my screen or someone is. Uh, anyway, that's fine. Um, and uh, and so something that we're, we're, we're launching, actually, we just made the page public today, um, is, is a research project on uh, agentic AI systems, um, as, as OpenAI calls them. Uh, and I think that's a good name for it. And one of the things we're looking at here is what happens when you have individuals or companies who 
configure um, a, a, an LLM with some other applications to help them conduct transactions. Um, and, you know, this is obviously already happening, you know, like go and find me a bunch of products that reach the, this or that kind of category. And, you know, with a extension on the web, it may do, you know, kind of several hops and find things and synthesize them, prioritize, and then give you back a nice list. And you could go further and further and further. And people are starting to explore um, how this could be used to supercharge um, commerce. So to get ahead of that, um, because obviously there's issues and and challenges that arise when people delegate an amount of authority to um, agentic systems um, to actually conduct transactions or to when they're holding themselves out to third parties that are interacting with them, maybe giving a quote or even closing a deal potentially or doing other things, um, it raises legal questions. And so, so, so this particular research project is going at um, something I'd mentioned that you and I have talked about in the past, but like the electronic agents and automated transactions and other similar provisions, um, um, you know, error control, security procedure, and other other relevant aspects of existing bodies of law, seeing how much mileage could we get out of uh, kind of using some of those legal frameworks as part of the design pattern and architecture for agentic systems in the context of, of these uh, agents doing uh, transactions on behalf of a, a principal, a person or organization, where there's a third party involved. Um, in this context, um, how, how what what do you imagine? This is a, a real timely question here, and it's very practical because we're, we're starting to dive into this. What what could be the the opportunities, uh, and also maybe the cautions for generating synthetic data um, to, to for, for for to configure and to develop agents that do this, but also to to test um, agents like in a in a control harness or a, or like a test harness to see how well they're performing and if they're going off the rails in some ways. So this is actually a question which um, we've been exploring a lot recently at Morph Labs. We've developed the system for automatically generating benchmarks for evaluation uh, for code bases. And like what we found is that as long as you can have an analytical guarantee, right, from like first principles reasoning or maybe like, like, you know, static analysis of a code that some question and an answer is correct, um, then you can blindly optimize against that, right? But one danger of um, having a system of AI judges you know, so to speak, is that um, their judgments may be imperfect, right? They're bounded by the um, uh, the capability of the underlying language model in a way. Uh, and so once you begin blindly optimizing against that, um, then the errors in those judgments will leak into the system that you're optimizing and compound. Uh, and so you have to be very careful about that. Um, so in the realm of software, um, like when we generate our benchmarks, like we use a combination of these techniques, right? So we use judgments from um, an AI senior software engineer, as well as um, like static analysis of the underlying code base. Um, and we've found some promising avenues for mitigating this like compounding over optimization effect. I think, um, so I think when working with like, so like agents in general and thinking about how to make them compliant, um, and also generating data against these judges, right? Like you can run against like some system of judges many, many times, um, and you can ostensibly get a data set that you can train on, um, but that's exactly where those compounding errors show up. Um, I think it's something which is solvable, but which is like right there at the boundary of applied research. Um, hopefully something that we'll make a lot more progress on very soon. Here, here. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but uh, we, we don't talk often enough for me not to take this opportunity. Uh, oh, Jesse, would you like to help us a little bit on this research project? I would be delighted to. Fantastic. Then the next time you refresh the page, you'll see your name magically appear <laughs> on, the, on the team. And thank you for that. And thank you really for taking the time again uh, to share with us your ideas and, and this sort of look over the horizon for many of us in, into the future and what's unfolding, what's important and, and what we can do uh, to, to beneficially take part in it. So thank you for sharing your judgment, your wisdom, your expertise in this area and to help us start point the way to the next horizon. Yeah, likewise, the perspectives at this workshop have been very refreshing. Here, here. Thank you. Now, um, we come to the wrap up of the workshop. Um, thank you to all speakers for, for your flash talks. Um, and now uh, uh, I want to uh, us to use the last few minutes to introduce and to celebrate our newest editor, 
at the MIT Computational Law Report, namely Olga Mack. She is royalty in the area of legal tech. Um, and she's got a, a, a truly august uh, background in the law and in technology and innovation. And uh, she's been a great collaborator uh, with law.mit.edu uh, over the years now and was, was a member of the task force that came up with those seminal guidelines uh, for the professional um, responsibility used by lawyers of generative AI. Looking forward, she's now going to lead the way on our next big public initiative, um, which involves a call for submissions. Who are we calling to? We're calling to you. Um, and so with that, um, Olga, thank you very much for agreeing to take the uh, the, the position and the leadership uh, of this. And won't you please introduce yourself and tell everybody uh, you know, what we're doing and how they can contribute. Well, hello, everyone. And wow, Daza, what a fantastic event. I am still processing the future of law is uh, tied to future of software. Um, Jesse, thank you for that. And I just love how you solicited a confirmation that Jesse is bound to help right on the spot because he was not able to say no. That was just a true art form. I, I will follow your lead. Um, I love the future of law, I, especially on the intersection of generative AI. Um, it is truly an exciting place, especially because for the first time in history, uh, lawyers are excited, more like nervous, excited, nervous and excited about this technology. Uh, previous technologies was just most nervous. Uh, this one actually includes excitement. And, and it's clear why. It's because it has so much opportunity, provide better services, improve our life as lawyers and really enjoy the practice of law. Uh, I think we can over time really bring fun back and go to practice of law because it's truly exciting. Um, also, thank you, Daza and Professor Megan Ma and Brian for bringing this group of diverse professionals together. I think it very much illustrates what we want the future of law to be. Uh, we want it to be, yes, full of excited lawyers and yes, full of other excited professionals because justice and law is something that we, we all as humans have a right to access and, and, and be part of um, and be served, most importantly, be served. So that brings me to this really exciting place, which um, I hope you all and folks you know and folks in your network join us in building. And that is the place where we have premier destination for repository of information that really encourages, well, first of all, sparks conversations, fosters innovation, and really supports and eliminates paths for everyone, lawyers and other professionals to be get up in the morning and be excited to contribute to the future of law. So with that, Daza, may I recruit you in showing screen so that I can talk and you can show and the two of us can have a show and tell. And you're on mute. Sorry. First of all, as promised, so it has been delivered. Jesse Hahn is now on the project page. Uh, and let's see if we can. Here we go. This you will find all ye who hear it at law.mit.edu. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong one. Um, law.mit.edu forward slash gen dash AI. So this is our call for submission and as i mentioned we have we would like to become a premier destination uh to spark conversation exchange ideas foster innovation and really be a supportive place uh we've listed uh daz and myself and uh, professor megan ma and brian have tried to give you some ideas of things we're looking for and you can see we are looking for all kinds of things and if you manage to come up with a category that we didn't come up with, guess what? We have a last category that says many more. So we encourage you to be really wide and broad in, in your submission and the kind of expertise you share with us. And the other thing I would like to point you is to what kind of things we're looking for. And uh, to echo what Brian said, yes, written works that are 
lawyers traditionally submit are very much welcome. Please know that we ask them to be two to 5,000 words because it's a lot of work to edit and, and publish and frankly encourage people to read more than 5,000 words. So unless you really truly have more than 5,000 words to share that are of value in every word, consider to stay within the, the word limit. But the most exciting thing here is that we want to encourage professionals who are not necessarily lawyers to use their tools of trade and submit their uh, submissions in whatever form they're comfortable. And so to this end, we're also inviting folks to submit things like developer notebooks. We really want to make sure that technologists are part of this community. Um, as you can tell from Leo's conversation and Allison's conversation and numerous other conversations, law is increasingly becoming a destination where code is very much tied to law and law is very much tied to code. And so some proficiency and works um, in developer notebooks are more than welcome. But think broader than that. Yes, written works, yes, developer notebooks, but consider videos, consider generative art, consider other media that we perhaps have not listed. Uh, again, we want to be welcoming of all kinds of professionals because all of us as humans have very much care about the future of law and, and it's something that should have access to everyone. So we, there are two, we, we, the plan is to publish two um, editions, one in the spring summer and one in the fall winter. And you can see the deadlines for submissions and for publishing uh, that we would love for you to, to keep in mind. So the, the first spring summer edition will be published somewhere in September, around September 17th of this year. And the deadline for submission is April 17th. So the form, I think there's a form link that if you can show folks where it is because it's a little subtle, is somewhat easy uh, it, and self-explanatory. Um, there are fields to fill out and works to attach or point links to. Um, and you might be thinking, how can you help? How can you be part of it? Um, I have three things that I will ask you to do. One, submit on time after you read the instructions and follow them. Two, encourage folks that that you see every day in your life that share ideas or do things or work on things that are worth sharing, kind of like the things we had presentations today, uh, things that would encourage wider conversations in the industry and encourage folks to build the future of law so we can all benefit. And then I'll ask you to do a third thing. Uh, you now have a link to the submission page if you can share it on your social media and encourage folks in your network to apply and apply on time and become part of this conversation, that would be a fantastic way for us to build the future of law together. Um, with that in mind, I look forward to reviewing edition, uh, every, all the submissions you have in whatever media that you choose to uh, submit. God help me to have um, software on my technology so I can read and open and be part of the conversation. Um, that's a back to you. Thank you so much, Olga. Thank you for stepping up um, to, to help uh, make this possible. So people have a surface area that they can't, where we can, as you said, encourage everybody to share from your perspectives about the, the advent of this um, new technology and its impact on and sort of implications for the law. Um, transformational it, it is a good word for it. And so it, this is something where it, it, it's a time to shed light and to encourage people to, to get involved, um, to share your work and so that we can all get educated now. So with that, um, I wanna thank everybody uh, for, uh, for speaking. I want to thank if all of you, um, especially those of you who stuck with it to the very end uh, for your active participation, um, will consider this the beginning. I, I know that we didn't have an opportunity to get to all of the questions and all of the comments. Um, and uh, this is our, as we customarily do with this workshop, 
kickoff for the themes and the topics that we'll be addressing at law.mit.edu through the year 2024. We hope that you'll stick with us. We hope that you'll continue to participate and to contribute. Um, so until the next time, we look forward to seeing you at law.mit.edu.